Okay, today we're going to continue uh, computation and memory. I uh, titled this lecture Near Data Processing, since we're going to, uh, yesterday we talked a lot about inside uh, the memory chip computation. Uh, here, uh, today we're going to talk more about uh, a little bit outside the memory chip, but in the logic layers. But again, a lot of the discussions that we will uh, have will be applicable to whatever you do inside as well. So I intend to finish uh, this topic today but I will uh, finish off what we started yesterday uh, also. By the way, feel free to ask questions at any time. Again, uh, I think some other people are following the course online, uh, but you have the luxury of actually asking questions here. Uh, and I will uh, monitor the questions in the chat. And if I miss something, uh, please tell me uh, and let me know. Okay, so let's get started. So remember, this is what we were covering yesterday. We talked about why we need intelligent memory controllers from the bottom up and top down and why uh, today is a really good time to think about, to think about it. And we're kind of very essentially constrained uh, in the middle with nowhere to escape today. Data movement is really uh, destroying the energy of the systems as well as performance of the systems. And we uh, were discussing two major directions of processing in memory that were not examined as much in the past, minimally changing memory chips which is actually a huge area of research uh, today, as well as product designs today uh, in um, computer architecture, but it spans across the stack, as you know. And the second one is also a huge area of research uh, as well as product design. So we're going to talk about that uh, today. And then we're gonna talk a lot about adoption concerns because whenever you want to change the paradigm, it's critically important to actually think about how to get the new paradigm uh, adopted. And in this case, the paradigm is changing across the stack. It's not just new hardware that you need to adopt without changing much in the software. You will need to change the software as well here. So we're, we're going to talk about that. Okay. So remember, we were talking about minimally changing memory chips. And these are some of the works that we covered. Uh, I would recommend you take a look at them. We're going to assign some of them, of course. Uh, but uh, keep reading papers and keep sharing uh, ideas and thoughts uh, that you may have uh, about the papers uh, anytime. Okay, this is the other work, and this is what we discussed a lot, Ambit work. And then I said that this is actually a newer work that you may want to look at uh, uh, that gives, uh, that, that's easier to read, let's say, in terms of how DRAM, uh, in terms of the background it provides on DRAM. And we said that there, uh, there are uh, proof of concept approaches that show that Ambit and row clone type of operations, bitwise operations actually work in off-the-shelf DRAM chips. And uh, similar ideas have been proposed for non-volatile memory. So the idea is actually very general, as you can see. And this is just one paper, actually. I could actually put many, many papers over here, but I didn't have time to do that. So if you're interested in the literature in this area, there's a lot of interesting work uh, that happens in this area. OK, and we, we stopped here. I'm going to sp sp spend some time here because I think it's important to really think about mindset whenever you're changing things. And this, this happens uh, not just in computer architecture, not just in science, not just in engineering. I think it happens all over the world. Uh, whenever you want to change things, you'll always get some pushback. Uh, sometimes nice pushback, but may oftentimes not so nice pushback also saying that why change? It's working okay. This is the, this is the nice pushback, of course, right? <laughs> you could actually get much worse pushback than this. And this mindset, I think, uh, limits progress in the end. There are many such examples in real life. I don't want to go into that, otherwise we will not have the lecture. I'll give you one example at the very end over here, but there's a lot of bandwidth waste in real life. There's latency and queuing delays in real life. My favorite example over here is the Tannen bar. Uh, I don't know if many of you uh, go out these days, but if you go out to Tannen bar, at least it used to be, uh, this is the coffee shop uh, uh, right across the uh, Inf, Inf building, uh, cab building. Uh, and if you go over there, uh, uh, there, there's a rotating door that you need to enter. And if you go there in the wrong time, you, uh, the bandwidth of the rotating door is very low. And if you go there in the long time, you have queuing delays and a lot of latency that you may experience. Anyway, of course, this is not this is a harmless type of uh, waste, I think, but it's a funny type of waste still. Uh, architectural concepts apply to uh, real systems that, that we experience, right? And that's a real system, right? Okay, I don't want to belabor this. I may give this example later on when we talk about quality of service, but this causes a quality of service problem, right? If you go there in the wrong time, 100 people may be in front of the door and maybe waiting in front of the door to actually go through that uh, low bandwidth uh, 
uh, rotating door. And as a result, you experience a lot of queuing delays. OK, let me give you an example of this one. This is actually a funny joke uh, that, uh, uh, again, points to the mindset issues. Uh, where would you, how would you decide where to build a bridge on a, on a river so that you can enable people to cross? Uh, I can use many cities as an example, but uh, I didn't have enough time. And I love New York City, so I, I picked New York City over here. Uh, and actually, there's a story related to this about IBM engineers. IBM is actually, IBM's major sites are located north of, of New York City. And uh, maybe I will use the IBM engineer as an example, basically. At one point, IBM engineers were commissioned to decide uh, where to actually build uh, a bridge uh, uh, in Manhattan, basically. So they, their commission was that. And clearly, you can see that Manhattan is surrounded by a lot of bodies of water, uh, one of them being the e Hudson River and the other way being uh, the East River over here, right? Uh, then the question is, how do you decide that, right? And the joke goes that these IBM engineers went through every single street uh, that crossed Manhattan horizontally. And they basically uh, stopped there uh, in every single street uh, well, for one hour, let's say. And they monitored how many cars were actually trying to cross the river from that point. So if you basically sit here for an hour, let's say, and you monitor how many cars are trying to actually cross the river at, some, at that point, right? Even though there is no bridge over there. And then you pro, for, perform a profile of that. So you figure out how many cars are trying to cross uh, uh, the, uh, the river at every point, at every uh, point that you have measured, and then you decide where to put the bridge, right? That sounds like a great way of putting the bridge, right? <laughs> of course not, clearly, because if there's no bridge, there are no cars that are going to cross the river at that point. So this is a chicken and the egg problem. This is very similar to hardware design, right? If there is no hardware that does something, clearly there are no, there's going to be no software that uses it. It's exactly the same question. It, I, clearly, my joke is very dumb, right? Who would ever do that? I guess, uh, I guess this, this joke was created to uh, joke about how conservative IBM was <laughs> at some point in time. And maybe it fits, maybe it doesn't fit. I'm not going to comment on that. It could fit the memory companies for sure today. Uh, I don't know if it fits IBM today. I think IBM is doing a lot of innovation today. But clearly, it's dumb to do that, basically. You don't want to go and uh, try to measure how many cars are crossing a non-existent bridge because there will be no cars crossing except for some crazy people perhaps which you're unlikely to encounter within the one hour you're profiling that location so basically it's the same thing with hardware uh, you, you'll always get pushback in hardware saying that oh but there's no software that uses it well duh clearly there was going, going to be no software that uses it because the hardware doesn't exist yet now put the hardware in and let's see if there's really no software that uses it right of course, this, this requires some risk at that point, right? And that risk is uh, not easy to take, but I think it's really important to take such risks uh, to do that. Uh, my, another, another story from real architecture is uh, Intel Pentium MMX, for example. These are multimedia extensions that were introduced by Intel in 1996, I believe 1996. Uh, and these were the first extensions, uh, SIMD, Single Instruction Multiple Data Extensions in General Purpose Processors. And we will cover them when we talk about GPUs. And we already covered them, actually, uh, in Digital Design Computer Architecture. If you want to go back and look at them, you can take a look. Uh, and these were introduced. And at the time they were being introduced, there was a huge debate with an Intel, basically, saying, should we really introduce these? There is no software that uses this stuff. Well, clearly there is no software that uses that stuff, right? Uh, SIMD extensions, because those SIMD extensions don't exist at this point. Of course, the question is, is there going to be software that uses this stuff? And uh, there was a huge debate, and it, uh, these, these things almost got, uh, the MMX extensions almost got killed, actually, internally. But uh, the people who were progressive, who were pushing for these extensions, actually won the debate in the end, and Intel implemented the MX, MMX extensions. And this was perhaps uh, one of the most successful instruction set extensions that have ever been introduced into the x86 ISA, right? Clearly, it's not called MMX anymore. It's, uh, it, it, it was revised into SSE. Uh, and then, uh, I don't even remember what SSE means. As you, can, you can see how successful it is uh, by not remembering what uh, those, uh, those things mean, right? I think it's called streaming SIMD extensions, yes. Uh, 
uh, and then AVX, Advanced Vector Extensions right now. And they're growing basically. They're, I think AVX 512 is basically operating on 512 bits at the same time uh, concurrently. Okay, so again, it's, the analogy is the same basically. If you don't build it, you will not see the, what will happen, right? Uh, but if you, you need to build it carefully, of course, if you build bridges on every location, in uh, Manhattan, clearly you're gonna incur a lot of cost and you'll be bankrupt probably. And uh, in addition, you will destroy the environment, of course, if you do that. So you need to be careful where you build the bridge uh, over here or over here, clearly. Uh, and you need to be careful in hardware what you do. Uh, you, you need to have some insight into what's going on. So processing in memory is another example. If you don't build the hardware, clearly the people will be reluctant uh, to use it, right? Well, uh, reluctant to build software for it, right? Who wants to build uh, bulk bit, uh, who wants to change their algorithms to, bulk, uh, to operate on bulk bitwise operations if there's no engine that can take advantage of it? Now, GPUs are one example, actually. That's why some people are actually changing their algorithms to take advantage of bulk bitwise operations. But uh, uh, things like MBIT, NDM, bulk bitwise execution engine, in NVM, uh, matrix multiplication engines require more effort than what GPUs do because today GPUs actually uh, are in a good place. It's, they're much more easily programmable uh, than before. So that's the, uh, that's the mindset, basically. That's why we're going to talk about mindset when we talk about hardware changes. GPUs are another example themselves of hardware changes, right? GPUs had existed since 1980s. Uh, and then uh, it was, uh, the people started using them as general purpose engine uh, in early 2000s, right? So there was a 20 year gap between uh, uh, they existed and uh, they became much more programmable uh, to be actually used uh, as uh, a more general purpose engine. And again, uh, there was a lot of pushback uh, clearly saying that, oh, what are we going to use this GPU for? But clearly some people banked on it, uh, took the risk and they got rich clearly. I'm, I'm referring to NVIDIA of course, in this case. Uh, and uh, they, they banked on the uh, gamble that these GPUs will be general purpose and there will be enough people there are enough workloads uh, that uh, will be translated uh, or programmed uh, on GPUs. And they were, of course, smart. They were not really gambling uh, without any knowledge, right? Uh, they were doing educated guesses because they were smart architects in the end and they enabled GPUs that way. So our processing is, in memory is very similar, basically. If you don't build row clone, you're not gonna get the benefits of it in software. And there's a lot of software uh, that exists that takes advantage of these things uh, that that can take advantage of these things uh, going forward but keep keep in mind this chicken and the egg problem and keep in mind again my example about the bridge because it shows how dumb this debate is right it's it's the same thing as trying to build a bridge uh, by profiling whether uh, people are actually crossing the non-existing bridge non-existent bridge okay uh, so let me continue i mean i've already given this example about rohammer actually rohammer is another example right uh, uh, I've already given you the story of the reviews and the Rohammer lecture, so I'm not going to talk about those again. Clearly, we believed in the problem and we uh, went ahead and published it, and there were enough people who agreed that it should be published, as you can see over here. But you, uh, clearly, no one built an attack uh, to flip bits before, even though people actually knew how to flip bits. You could actually have physical access to flip bits, right? But no one actually cared about that. Uh, I mean, no one is a very strong word clearly, but the majority of the uh, people in the world, security researchers in the world didn't care about it because it was just too, too impractical to launch an attack. But once you actually build uh, or show that Rohammer exists, then everybody started building attacks, right? Clearly, this is another example. If you don't, uh, so one of the viewers, if you remember, uh, was saying, oh, this doesn't, uh, this is not a realistic, this, this doesn't occur in a realistic usage scenario. This viewer was very narrow-minded, clearly, right? They weren't thinking what people can do. They didn't have the security perspective, for example. If they had the security, we had the security perspective when we wrote in the paper that this could be an attack. Uh, and later people actually created many, many attacks. So that's another example, basically. It's not uh, uh, building hardware clearly in this case, but it's discovering something in hardware that affects software in a very major way. And you will get pushback on that also saying that, oh, this doesn't affect anything, right? And we did get that pushback as you can see, right? <laughs> I can tell you these stories from my own research as you can see. Okay, but we, all, we already know that uh, Rohammer exists. Actually, I was, uh, I, I'm going to give a talk about Rohammer later today in a conference. Uh, so I was doing some research uh, 
clearly, I, we discussed three papers about Rohammer in 2020, but I actually went ahead and looked at uh, some co other conferences. So for example, this is Micro 2020. Uh, people are looking at protection mechanisms for Rohammer. People are actually coming up uh, uh, with other attacks, as you can see. This is uh, a conference that's going to happen next week, actually. Micro I, I believe it's next week, October 17th or something. Uh, basically, people are coming up with attacks. And we actually got rejected from Micro, if you remember, uh, from in 2013, uh, saying that uh, this is not a realistic thing. Nobody's going to build architectural solutions for it. And seven years later, in the same conference, you can see that uh, people are actually still concerned about it. <laughs> Okay, this is another one actually. There's a session on Rohammer in IEEE security and privacy. You can see two of them are our papers, but two of them are other papers that are interesting. Uh, like these folks are actually trying to leverage electron magnetic side channel information to detect Rohammer attacks, which is I think an interesting approach. Can you somehow detect Rohammer attacks with some side channel information that you gather from the system? And these folks actually show that Rohammer creates a side channel, which is interesting. We did talk about the other one. So this is another, actually, I, I found out that there's another paper in Usenix Security uh, that looks at uh, essentially attacking deep neural networks uh, using uh, Rohammer bit flips, uh, such that deep neural network becomes uh, essentially useless, let's say. They say depleting the intelligence, but uh, it, it, it may actually give you wrong results. Uh, okay, there are many other works that I'm not uh, going to cover, but I will just say more to come, uh, believe in it. So I will end with a positive note. So I think you're, you're, you may end up being researchers, you may end up going to industry, whatever you do, you may end up doing consulting. Uh, whatever you do, uh, I will suggest that you follow your passion. Uh, they, uh, especially if your passion is very disruptive, uh, there will be a lot of naysayers, people who basically go against it, people who try to kill it, uh, kill the ideas, people who uh, try to basically uh, say this doesn't work without any evidence, et cetera, et cetera. I've, I've given you a lot of examples of this, I think, at this point. Follow your passion. Believe in the work. Uh, of course, get the good feedback. If there's good feedback, don't ignore it, because feedback always improves things. Uh, but uh, there's destructive feedback, and there's also uh, reasons why people uh, are, are uh, negative or, let's say, toxic a little bit. So follow your passion, believe in it, uh, and be resilient in the end. That's uh, that's important because if, if you're not resilient in the end, you will drop the project based on somebody's random thought and uh, essentially, essentially you, will not, you will never build a bridge and then uh, the traffic will be horrible uh, in New York City, let's say, right? Uh, same thing, you will never uh, invent the next paradigm in computing uh, and uh, our computers will be as horrible as they are today, right? So, and I would suggest focusing on learning and scholarship because in the end, the scientific method, learning and scholarship, if it's applied well and correctly, it wins, basically. It's much better than any other method, any other dogma uh, that is presented uh, as an alternative, because I, th I don't think any dogma can be an alternative to uh, scientific method and learning and scholarship. And there are many dogmas in the world, especially today. It's amazing that we still have it so much in 2020, right? But uh, yeah. Uh, well, dogma is something that you, that you believe without evidence, right, in the end, and there's a lot that happens. Uh, okay, so, and, th and then in the end, the quality of your work uh, defines your impact, right, uh, and that's really important. Okay, if you're interested, there's more, as we discussed, and as I mentioned, there's a fun reading about this also, uh, although this is narrowly focused on whether Einstein can get published today. Uh, I actually believe that he will not get published today, but uh, it's good that he lived earlier. Okay, uh, so with that, I think aside, uh, hopefully that's useful, uh, but I wanted to cover it because I think it's important uh, to do this uh, uh, because a lot of things, a lot of things we discussed, there are technical aspects of it uh, and your technical aspects will be challenged as well, no question about that, but some of those challenges are coming from uh, the mindset direction, basically. People are not in the right mindset uh, 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 to actually accept some of the ideas. And you, uh, it's very important to be very uh, clear about the mindset. For example, you can always give the bridge example to someone who says, oh, this hardware is, not go is going to be useful, useless because there is no software uh, that uses it, right? Okay, with that said, uh, let's talk about uh, 3D stacked memory now, near data processing. Uh, and uh, we were talking about two approaches uh, to, uh, uh, okay, well, two approaches to processing in memory. And if we're done, I think minimally changing memory chips. We may talk about this again 
when we talk about non-volatile memories, emerging technologies briefly, uh, but I'm not going to uh, go back to it, but we may actually give some other examples uh, later on. Uh, okay, uh, let's talk about exploiting 3D stack memory. And as I said, these are both thinking differently from the past approaches. We're still thinking memory as an accelerator. It doesn't matter if you're minimally changing memory, if the accelerator is inside the memory here or inside the logic layer here, uh, we're still thinking about memory as an uh, accelerator. So similar issues are, are going to exist in 3D stack memory. So some of the adoption issues that we will have uh, will be similar across both of these directions. So what, is the, what, are, what are we going to do? So we have an opportunity, basically. These 3D stack logic and memory systems exist. So hybrid memory consortium is one example. Uh, you basically put uh, a logic layer underneath memory layers. You can connect these layers with very high bandwidth low latency and reasonably low energy connections called true silicon vias today. And you can have, let's say, thousands or more of these true silicon vias that are connecting these layers. And you can fabricate it today. These things exist. Uh, high bandwidth memory, which is employed in GPUs, is an example of it. You could actually fabricate it this way also. But in GPUs, it's fabricated uh, because GPU actually ca causes a lot of heat. You don't want to put the GPU underneath memory layers, so it actually leads to a lot of errors in that case, so reliability issues need to be solved. The way this type of memory, high bandwidth memory, is used in GPUs is you have the logic layer, uh, uh, and then you connect it to uh, a memory layer in 2.5D with some sort of silicon interposer uh, underneath, essentially. I'm not going to talk about that right now because that's not going to uh, be what enables uh, uh, near data processing very well. Although you could imagine doing the uh, near data processing in the logic layer as well uh, when you have a GPU-based uh, system with high bandwidth memory. Uh, but high bandwidth memory uh, also can exist. That's a, that's a memory standard. It also can exist in this 3D stack manner. In fact, when it was first proposed, it was 3D stack. But people figured out that there are some thermal issues that need to be solved uh, in the longer run. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, they decided to use the 2.5D stack manner in GPUs. But this is a big opportunity, clearly. As you can see, you have uh, very high bandwidth, low latency, and low energy access to a lot of memory. You're limited by thermal constraints in the end. That's the downside at this point. As a result of those thermal constraints, you cannot put as many stacks as you want today. Uh, and as a result, the memory capacity uh, that you have is limited. But fine. You, uh, today, we have actually, I believe, 16 gigabytes or 8 gigabyte memories, which is not bad uh, to do operations on, right? Uh, Okay, and in the future, I believe the future is even brighter. Uh, I believe we will have more stacks. Thermal issues will uh, be solved. Maybe we'll have different cooling technologies. People are looking at different cooling technologies. And other true three-dimensional technologies are under development. These are called monolithic three-dimensional technologies. And the idea is not to have three silicon vias, but actually vias, very simple, small vias, uh, connecting different layers with each other. And those vias uh, in some technologies are uh, manufactured with carbon nanotubes, for example. Uh, and I think those are very interesting. There's work going on in Stanford uh, about this called the Next Project, for example, and 3XT. Uh, I'd recommend looking into that. And those enable even bigger opportunities, I believe, going into the future. Of, of course, all these technologies now have their downsides uh, and keep those in mind at this point. They're not mature yet. This 3D stacking is mature with a limitation that you have thermal issues potentially if you put too much uh, switching logic inside the logic layer. And as a result, you also cannot put a lot of uh, memories on top of uh, memory layers on top of the logic layer. So I believe it's, it's always good to believe in the technology going into the future also, because there are a lot of people investing into these technologies. And I believe the, some of these issues will become much better going into the future. So it's a good uh, idea to think about this direction. And this is actually uh, from our Ramulator paper. This is the Ramulator simulator that we released to the community in 2015. Uh, and you're going to actually use it in one of your labs into the future uh, to uh, implement various things. Uh, but basically, we, uh, at, at the time we wrote this paper, we surveyed what kind of DRAM exists. And our goal was to actually have a simulator that can simulate many, many different types of DRAM. Clearly, there's different types of DRAM, commodity, low power graphics, and high performance. Uh, but clearly, you can see that there are a lot of 3D stack DRAMs also. Some of them are for low power devices. Some of them are for high performance devices. For example, MCDRAM. Uh, interesting, I don't remember what MC stands for right now, but uh, uh, anyway, uh, but this was used in Intel's uh, Knights Landing processors because they need very high bandwidth uh, access to DRAM uh, from their Knights Landing processor. So, okay, multi-channel DRAM, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, uh, 
Excellent. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a version of, I would say it's a version of high bandwidth memory actually, uh, it's done uh, 3D stacked. Okay, and there are clearly many academic proposals, some of which you're going to see and some of which you have already seen uh, here. Okay, clearly 3D stacked memories exist and they're going to be uh, even uh, better into the future. Now, let's take a look at uh, uh, what questions you may ask. Uh, uh, okay, uh, somebody said it's actually HMC. I don't know if it, uh, Intel actually publicly admitted that. Is that correct? Uh, do you have public references that it's HMC? Uh, meaning, uh, yeah, it's done with Micron, but uh, it may, may or may not be uh, HMC. I agree it's done with Micron. <laughs> anyway, I'd be interested in uh, references where they actually discuss uh, this. Uh, if it's HMC, it'd be good to know for sure. Uh, but with a reference. <laughs> okay, uh, so, uh, but these are very good points actually. Uh, yes, Intel and Micron actually collaborated together uh, because Intel doesn't uh, manufacture memories uh, uh, well, it used to manufacture memories, actually. Intel is the first company uh, that manufactured the first DRAM chip in 1970s. Uh, and uh, they got out of the memory business uh, thinking that it was not as profitable, uh, which was perhaps correct at the time, but uh, uh, they would have been in a much better position uh, right now if actually they also had the memory business uh, themselves, right? Uh, but, but clearly they uh, moved out of the memory business and they focused on the CPU a microprocessor business for decades and decades, even though they manufactured the first DRAM chip uh, in 1970s. Uh, we may talk about that uh, uh, later on. Okay, uh, basically, uh, it, yeah, Intel collaborated with Micron to actually uh, do the MCDRAM design for their Knights Landing processors because they needed the very high bandwidth access uh, to main memory. They did also collaborate with Micron to uh, uh, manufacture a 3D X point, for example, that we discussed earlier that we're going to discuss a little bit more. Okay, anyway, that's a, a, another site. Uh, now, we, these 3D stack memories exist and they're going to get better. So uh, can we use them for processing in memory or near data processing? As I said, I'm gonna use these interchangeably. Uh, meaning, can we do operations on the logic layer such that we can accelerate applications uh, and uh, uh, minimize data movement? So there are two major questions over here that we're going to look at. The first is what are the performance and energy benefits of using 3D stacked memory as a coarse grained accelerator for some applications by changing the entire system. So it's always good to, whenever you have a research task at hand and where you're envisioning the future, it's always good to imagine two things. First is I have no limitations. I can change the entire system. How do I change the entire system to take advantage of this new technology? How do I change the workload? Basically I have no limitations across the stack. Let me do it. Let me see what benefits I get. This gives you the upper bounds. So I like this approach. And then you maybe say, okay, what are the smaller things that I do? Uh, but let's talk about that later. And then there's the other extreme, which is what, what is the minimal thing that I can do to provide reasonable benefits? Uh, and what kind of benefits do I get if I do the minimal thing to take advantage of this technology? So these are two ends of the spectrum, basically. Uh, what is the maximal thing that I can do if I had no limitation? in life as a, well, of course, you may need to consider some limitations like thermal limitations a little bit. Uh, you don't want to be unrealistic, but I had no limitation in terms of programming model, for example, in terms of how I change the application, in terms of uh, what kind of logic that I put over there, respecting some of the technology's constraints, et cetera. What is the ma maximum thing I can do? And what is the minimum thing I can do? So a minimum thing is really important because it enables adoption. It keeps you on the ground a little bit saying, okay, uh, what kind of adoption issues should I consider? Maximum thing is good because it lets you imagine and dream and it lets you find uh, what are the potential benefits of the technology, assuming you do it good enough, of course. Of course, there is a, a continuum in between uh, these things, right? Uh, for example, without changing the entire system, but what if I do just simple function offloading without significantly changing the applications and uh, without significantly changing the virtual memory, without significantly changing coherence issues, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so you can think about some middle grounds in between. Uh, it's always good to explore that middle ground as well. And we will see some of the explorations of that middle ground uh, in this uh, uh, lecture as well. But let's start with this maximal thing. Uh, uh, by changing the entire system, what kind of benefits we can get? And whenever you're thinking about the maximal thing, uh, meaning if you have a technology and if you want to actually get the maximal benefit, it's always good to think about an application because if you go general purpose, 
uh, that, then you need to consider many, many applications, let's say hundreds of applications. And it's hard to really, then you, you, you immediately go into trade-offs with applications because you want to excite everything, uh, general purpose, then it's going to be not so easy. You're going to be in the space where, for example, Intel and AMD are, they're going to execute general purpose processors. As a result, they cannot execute any application as fast as, as, fast as they could. So it's good to think about applications whenever you think about uh, uh, maximal benefits from an accelerator. And that's what we're going to do over here. With minimal benefits, you may not actually think about that as much, right? but with maximal benefits, it's always a good idea to think about applications. And when we actually uh, decided to start uh, this work, it was around 2012, late 2012, uh, we basically uh, said graph processing is a really great application because it's employed clearly many places over here. It's employed in genomics, increasingly employed in genomics today, actually. Uh, uh, so there's, there's, uh, it's, it's employed in machine learning frameworks, for example. A lot of the machine learning frameworks are based on graph uh, processing underneath. So clearly, many important applications uh, are using graph processing, even if you don't care about Facebook over here. By the way, there's a joke on the slide. I never changed the slide over here uh, because it was created around 2015. And I gave this talk at Facebook at some point and they told me that this is wrong. They have 2.33 billion or whatever uh, users, which is amazing, I think 2.33 billion, if that's true. Uh, but then I didn't want to change that because I didn't want to go and find the reference. I just said circa 2015, this is the case because if I change that, I have to change all of these things also, right? So this is 2015 value, uh, numbers clearly. If you go to 2020, probably these are much higher uh, today, right? And it still amazes me that there are two points, whatever, and uh, billion Facebook users today. Okay, uh, jokes aside, uh, clearly graph processing, graph analytics is an important problem, uh, even if you don't care about some of these things over here. Uh, and scalable, large scale graph processing is actually challenging. And throwing cores at the problem uh, does not buy you performance. Here we are uh, quadrupling the number of cores, as you can see, on one application. I believe it's PageRank, uh, which is at the core of Google's search algorithm. Clearly, it, it, it goes over a graph and ranks different nodes, especially neighboring nodes, for example. Uh, and then basically you see that you get only 40%, 42% performance improvements, even though you're throwing four times the resources at it. It doesn't sound good, right? Then the question is, of course, why? If you go and analyze a lot of the graph algorithms, this is PageRank's core. Uh, basically, uh, I'm not going to go into the details of this. Again, this paper may be assigned uh, to you at some point. You get frequent random memory accesses because graph nodes uh, are not allocated close to each other and the graphs can be very dynamic. As a result, uh, the things that you're accessing are actually in random places in memory, uh, mostly. So you get frequent random memory accesses and you have little amount of computation to do on the graph nodes. As a result, you're very much bandwidth bottlenecked uh, because of these random accesses. Now, this doesn't mean that all of the parts of a graph analytics application uh, is uh, really random. There is actually some locality in graph analytics applications, and you can inc also increase the locality a little bit. Uh, but fundamentally, there are some random accesses, depending on the nature of the problem. In PageRank, for example, for sure, you have random accesses. Uh, in breadth first search, for example, that's another place where you can get random accesses if you don't uh, have everything sorted. But even if you have everything sorted, you can get random accesses. Uh, so basically, uh, a good chunk of the graph processing kernels have random accesses with little amount of computation. As a result, this is exercising the memory bottleneck that we discussed, right? If, if you remember the picture that I showed you with uh, energy costs of different operations, this is really exercising the energy costs. It's not exploiting locality as much, at least in this big part of the kernel, uh, but you're bringing data all the way from the memory many, many times uh, to do simple operations. You can see it's a multiplication, simple multiplication uh, and an addition, okay? So basically, it's really a bottleneck by memory as a result. So we said basically, what can we do uh, to use 3D stacked logic plus memory engines to actually improve the performance uh, of graph processing, accelerate it, and also make it more efficient? And as I said, we started this work in 2012. It was eventually published in 2015. This also got a couple of pushbacks, let me put it that way. I think it was rejected two or three times. I don't remember, but I didn't have time to look up everything. So. Uh, there's a story behind this work also clearly. But this work uh, is now published and has had a lot of impact. I'm gonna briefly talk about uh, the work that builds on it also, uh, because there's a lot of work that built on it actually to make things better. Uh, and I'm gonna give you an example of how you can make things better. But before, let's, start, let's get started in terms of the system design. So this is a system design work, meaning you go all the way from an application to circuits. Uh, well, logic, let's say. We don't exactly change the circuits, but we change the logic 
internally here. Uh, and uh, and we, want to, we wanted to use 3D stack logic plus memory chips, as you can see. And uh, essentially, if you look at uh, the logic layer of uh, a, a 3D stacked memory like this, the logic layer is divi divided into what's called vaults. It's V-A-U-L-T. Uh, each vault controls the memory layers on top of it. Basically, it's partitioned into vaults, and each vault controls the partition that's assigned to it, uh, above it. And each vault normally has essentially a DRAM controller, memory controller, okay? And these vaults are connected to each other with some sort of network uh, so that you can transfer data in between. Uh, basically, what we're going to do is we're going to add a very simple in-order processing core, lightweight, to each vault so that you can have, let's assume that this is 64, you have 64 cores over here. And 64 cores, each core can operate on the data that's on top of it. And these cores can communicate with each other because there's some network and there's a network interface, as you can see over here, such that they can communicate. Now, this sounds good, right? This looks like a distributed system on a chip. And it is actually, it is a distributed system on a chip. It's uh, in-order cores connected together. So we decided these are lightweight, simple in-order cores because if you actually put a very complicated out-of-order core over here, uh, you generate a lot of heat and uh, the thermal uh, constraints in this logic layer and the memory layers uh, are, are violated. So we actually put simple in order course. Another option is to actually put a very lightweight out of order course potentially or reconfigurable logic or fixed function accelerators as we will see later on or a combination of those. I actually am a big believer in putting uh, reconfigurable logic here uh, because that can enable uh, a lot of uh, applications to actually customize uh, what goes on, and it's much more efficient than an in-order core, clearly. But there's an advantage to the in-order core because it's programmable here. So this is like an ARM core, simple ARM core. Okay, so I've given you what happens in the logic layer now. These cores can communicate with each other. Now, as I said, the capacity of a single 3D stack, and so these are called cubes. 3D stack memory plus logic chip is called a cube. The capacity of a single cube uh, is not uh, large. It's, let's say, 16 gigabytes. I think we evaluated four gigabytes or eight gigabytes. I don't remember now. You can read the paper clearly. But let's assume that it's 16 or 32 gigabytes. Let's, let's be aggressive, right? 32 gigabytes is possible, I think, today. Uh, I believe, actually, even 64 gigabytes is possible. But let's do 32 over here. This is 32 gigabytes. If your graph is uh, one terabyte, clearly, you're not going to be able to fit it inside one cube, right? So what we do is to have a scalable system, we connect these cubes. So we have many of these cubes. And then we connect them through some other sort of interconnect. And you can read the interconnect in the paper. I think it's Dragonfly. We will talk about different sorts of interconnects uh, in, uh, uh, when we talk about interconnects later in the course. Uh, but there's, there is some sort of interconnect in the end that interconnects these uh, different cubes. But keep in mind, the interconnect over here is off chip. So a cube is a chip. When, whenever you, want to you need to communicate between a cube and another cube, you need to go off chip. So the bandwidth here is very precious. And latencies are high and energy is high, of course. So ideally, you would like to do the processing inside a cube, ideally inside a vault, basically. OK, and then this, uh, this accelerator is connected to the host processor uh, with a non-cacheable physically addressed interface, like a GPU, like an early form of GPU. Basically, what you do is you offload your graph computation. You lay out your graph. I'm going to talk about that right now. But you lay out your graph on top of these nodes. You offload your computation. And this accelerator basically operates on its own. It goes through your graph and basically generates results, and then eventually it communicates these results if needed to the host processor, depending on what you do, of course, uh, or it, it can output stuff into the host processor also uh, to, to the screen or wherever you need to. It's, it's like a GPU, think about it that way. You offload some computation to the GPU and you get the results back, right? And the GPU churns for, I don't know, two days, let's say. Uh, it could be true for graph processing also, but sometimes you communicate information uh, depending on what the processor wants. Okay, so you can think of it that way, essentially. Uh, now, what do you do? So you want to do graph computations on top of it, which means that you have a graph, and that graph needs to be mapped to, to these memories. So, uh, and that is an important part of the problem. Is how do you partition the graph uh, such that uh, you minimize the communication between graph nodes? So, okay, uh, somebody partitions the graph. Graph nodes are partitioned across the cubes. And then within the cube, the graph nodes are partitioned across the vaults. As I said, a vault operates on the... Uh, uh, graph nodes that's on top of it. And the key here is the graph nodes never move, meaning we don't move the data. If we want to operate on a graph node, we send a message to the core 
that houses the graph node on top of it. That's the idea over here. Basically, we're moving uh, processing to the data as opposed to data to the processing, which is an existing systems. So essentially, we, we initiate remote function calls. This is program using remote function calls, remote procedure calls. If you want to do an operation on a graph node, you send a remote function call to the in-order core that houses the graph node. This means that everybody knows where the graph nodes reside, so there's some overhead to uh, figure that out. But once you figure that out, you can send a message to the core uh, that houses the graph node. And that's, uh, let's assume that that core operates and then sends the result back. Uh, and then that results, uh, and then you may send another message to another graph node, right? So, and then you can update the graph node. So graph nodes are updated in place, basically. They don't move, okay? So it's a very different paradigm, as you can see. Uh, it's near data processing. In fact, uh, it's in the core that houses the data processing. Of course, you will need to communicate intermediate values uh, to, to be added to the graph node, for example, and those are the data that still needs to be communicated. Uh, clearly, you cannot uh, localize everything in this case. So if that's the case, then what you would really like to do is maximize the locality of graph nodes, meaning if you're operating on this graph nodes over here, you don't want to actually communicate much somewhere else. Certainly, you, don't want, you want to minimize communication across the boundary of these cubes. You don't want to go across the chips, clearly, because bandwidth is very limited over here, whereas bandwidth is very abundant over here, as I will show you in a little bit, because these cores have low latency, high bandwidth, low energy access to the memory uh, that's right next to it, uh, connected via through silicon vias, whereas that's not the case when you actually cross the chip boundaries, as we already know. So as you can see, the graph partitioning is important. Uh, somebody needs to partition the graph such that you will minimize communication across these chips. And essentially, we did some work, uh, but we didn't do the best partitioning. We basically wanted to get a proof of concept out. But later works actually showed that if you do graph partitioning in a much better way, you can get even higher performance than what we have shown, what I'm going to show you in a little bit. Uh, and later works also showed uh, many other optimizations uh, to, to this uh, for improving bandwidth, et cetera, uh, improving the network also. So for example, here we assume crossbar network, it's expensive. Uh, here we assume Dragonfly, it's also expensive, but you could actually reduce the strength of the network and be more intelligent about it and get better performance. So essentially later works uh, improved the performance that I'm going to show you by almost an order of magnitude, uh, or maybe more, uh, because there was a lot of works and I, I clearly couldn't examine every single one. Okay, uh, hopefully this gives you an idea. If you have questions, please uh, interrupt me and feel free to ask. So uh, clearly we are changing a lot here, right? Uh, what have we changed? Well, we, we're not processing graphs as we are processing in the host processor clearly. Somebody needs to map the graphs nicely to these cubes. Somebody needs to map them nicely to here. We're changing the logic layer significantly. I haven't even talked about some of the changes over here. I'm going to get to them. Uh, we've changed the interface to this thing, even though it kind of looks like a GPU still, it's not a GPU. Uh, we've changed uh, virtual memory. Basically, we got rid of virtual memory in graph processing. It's physically addressed. Uh, as you can see, there are a lot of changes that we have done to the system. And that's what I mean by changing potentially everything. And we also changed the programming model. Basically, uh, in order to operate on graphs right now using Tesseract, uh, our system is called Tesseract. It's three-dimensional hypercube, basically. That's what a Tesseract means. Uh, and uh, essentially, uh, you need to uh, program using remote function calls. Now, if you are used to programming distributed systems, data centers, it's not a problem, I think. Uh, basically, those are programmed using remote function calls, remote procedure calls. Uh, so you invoke operations on a remote server uh, by sending the arguments, uh, by sending the function and arguments to the function and telling the server execute it and return me the result. Basically, we're doing essentially that. And we're doing it on a single, well, I don't want to say single, but on, the, on, a sing, uh, on a distributed system on a chip, plus on a distributed system uh, across the cubes. So we, are, we essentially have a distributed system and we're programming it like a distributed system, basically. So programming is not that different from a distributed system, but it's very different from an existing host processor. Normally you don't use message passing. So this is called message passing. You're passing messages between these execution units to actually do the computation. And remote function calls are actually one example of the messages. And uh, that's how we do the computation over here. So we're changing the programming model as you can see. So let's take a look at that a little bit. So this is uh, the page rank uh, computation, the core computation. You're updating the rank clearly based on the weights of uh, your neighboring nodes. Now they could be in different vaults, as you can see. So if you want to update the rank on a different vault, we basically send a message. Uh, 
a remote function call uh, to the Walt saying, Walt, please execute this function. Okay, it's essentially the same thing over here, translated into a remote function call. I'm not gonna go through the details, you can read the paper and you need support from the uh, instruction set architecture for this. Uh, the paper doesn't talk a lot about these because there's a lot in the paper because it's, uh, it essentially extends over the entire system, but you need instruction set architecture support for this uh, and et cetera, basically. And uh, these function calls can be non-blocking, meaning that you could issue many function calls uh, from your program that's running on Walt 1. In this case, Walt 1 is issuing function calls, you can see, uh, that, are that, could be, that should be executed in Walt 2, for example. In the next uh, iteration of this loop, you may actually send a function call to Walt 10. In the next iteration, you may actually send it to Walt 100, et cetera, as you can see. Uh, basically, you can keep sending these remote function calls. They can be executed in parallel in the distributed system. And then you wait after, uh, you need, uh, until you need the results of the function calls. That's what this barrier is about. So barrier is clearly used in uh, distributed systems programming also. So we use it over here as well to enable the non-blocking remote function calls. So this gives you an idea of the programming model. If you're programmed with distributed systems, this is not going to be new to you, except it's done at a very low, uh, well, it doesn't have to be done at a very low level, but you will need to know the vaults uh, where they are. You can imagine, of course, enhancing the system uh, uh, by making the vaults virtual and then a virtual to physical mapping layer. And those things, all of those can still be applied uh, to the system, but I'm not going, I'm not going to go through uh, those. Uh, you, can, you can do all of the optimizations that we know in computer engineering uh, to make things more efficient over here. Okay, so this is a remote function call. It's non-blocking. Again, you send the function address and arguments to the remote core, uh, another vault in this case. Uh, the remote core stores the incoming message in the message queue. And uh, it flushes the message queue when it's full or when it's reached the synchronization barrier, basically. Flushes meaning it executes uh, things. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, there's also a blocking function call. Uh, blocking function call basically blocks uh, uh, whenever you send a message. Let's say you have a blocking put. Uh, whenever you send it, you wait for the result before you go and execute the next instruction. Clearly, there are benefits to this if, if you need the result uh, immediately. Okay, uh, so hopefully the programming model is clear. Uh, if people have questions, feel free to ask. Uh, we also add some prefetching mechanisms over here so that the in-order core actually can tolerate some latencies. Basically, if we have in-order cores, as I said, in the vault, uh, it turns out there's so much memory bandwidth on top of it that is that an in-order core is ineffective at exploiting all of that memory bandwidth. So we add simple prefetching mechanisms so that we can prefetch ahead and make the in-order core more efficient while exploiting the memory bandwidth that's available to it in a, a useful fashion. And there are multiple different types of prefetching mechanisms. I, again, encourage you to read the paper. One of them is linear prefetching. It ex exploits the locality, spatial locality existing in parts of the graph. And the other is message triggered prefetching. This is actually interesting because it's, it exploits the message, message passing model. So for example, if, if uh, in-order core is processing one of the messages, it's slow because it takes time. Uh, you, you can scan the message queue over here and look at what other addresses you need in the future, right? And then you can actually have a prefetcher that takes those addresses and uh, prefetches them into the caches of the in-order core. So that's the idea over here. Uh, I mean, not, nothing rocket science, as you can see, but it's important to actually exploit the memory bandwidth over here. Okay, so let's take a look at, uh, I'm not gonna go into more detail. The paper has a lot more detail about a lot of other issues that I'm glossing over right now, but these are the most important ones, I think. Uh, let's take a look at results right now, uh, because results are going to be important here, right? Because we're thinking big here. We want to actually see what is the potential benefit if we actually do this big thing. Uh, and we're gonna simulate, of course, for these results because these things were not available to us at that time. Uh, and even if they're available to you, uh, you may not be able to publish about them. Uh, so we didn't want to go through that route clearly. Uh, okay, uh, so we, uh, this is a DDR-based system, DDR3-based system, uh, which is not the state of the art, as you can see. It has 102 gigabytes per second. And then this is a hybrid memory cube-based system. You, so these are 3D stacked memories over here, so they provide very high bandwidth, but uh, they're not uh, 3D stacked uh, with the cores because these are very heavy cores. So it gets 640 gigabytes per second. Uh, bandwidth. These are traditional systems with compute memory dichotomy, basically. And then these are, uh, this is again, hybrid memory uh, cube based system, but uh, we use many core over here because our cores are not going to be as powerful as these. So we want uh, equal comparisons, control 
controlled comparison. So there are 512 in order cores, as you can see. And they, again, have access to only 640 gigabytes per second bandwidth at the time. These were the highest numbers at the time in 2015 when the paper was published. And Tesseract is, if you look at it, looks different, right? It's not the same. It doesn't have the compute memory dichotomy because each cube over here is computation and memory at the same time. Logic layer has computation and memory layers has memory. And you basically connect the cubes. So you cannot distinguish between compute and memory over here, as you can see uh, in this picture. And you can see that we have 512 uh, in order cores. So that's why we compare to this. But the key thing to see over here is those 512 in order cores get access to eight terabytes per second internal uh, hybrid memory cube bandwidth over here, 3D stacked memory bandwidth essentially. So this is huge, as you can see. We can enable the huge bandwidth to uh, these cores. Whereas no existing system that has a processor memory dichotomy has uh, uh, that capability. Okay, so let's take a look at results. I'm gonna give you average results. You can take a look at the paper for more details. We looked at five key graph processing algorithms that are commonly used. And essentially, uh, this is the comparison that you see over here. Uh, if you look at the highest benefit, we get about 13 to 14 X performance improvement on average across five algorithms, which is quite substantial. Uh, it's more than an order of magnitude. And this is end-to-end -end performance uh, on, on the algorithms. You can see that existing systems don't do well. Hybrid memory cube buys performance. It's higher bandwidth, but not a lot, right? And if, if you actually make the course simpler, you lose performance. Whereas here, we have simple cores. We don't have even have out-of-order cores, uh, but we have much higher performance. You can see the benefit of prefetching. So this is without prefetching. This is with prefetching. So prefetching actually buys you a lot because we're utilizing the bandwidth for a good purpose, as you can see. And these are different types of prefetching, as you can see. Okay, so this is very promising, as you can see. And as I said, future work actually improved upon uh, our results. In fact, there was a per work, I think, in micro 2019. It's called GraphQ, I think, something like that. I don't remember exact name, but GraphQ may be the name. Uh, they basically did a lot of interesting optimizations on top of what we have proposed. And they show that they could out outperform what we've done by, uh, I think, in, a, in, a, in aggregate, a total, uh, an order of magnitude. So basically, you can improve graph processing performance by around 100x, assuming you combine all of those results, which is significant, right? It's two orders of magnitude you know, on a real application. Okay. And uh, you can see that this memory bandwidth consumption actually provides a good chunk of the benefits. We're consuming 2.9 terabytes per second over so 8 terabytes per second available to the cores. Not all of it is useful bandwidth that's consumed, but uh, this also shows you that we're in inefficient. We're not getting all the uh, bandwidth. We're not uh, consuming all the bandwidth that's available to us, meaning that there's so still room for optimization in our work. And graph partitioning is one example. Basically, Maybe we didn't partition the graph really well. As a result, we're not exploiting the bandwidth on top of the cores, right? Because we need to go off chip. And whenever you, go, you need to go off chip, you're really you, uh, uh, losing the opportunity to stay on chip, meaning exploit the bandwidth that you have on top of the core. As a result, you're not efficient, right? So graph partitioning is a key concern over here. And one of the future works uh, that came after this work actually showed that graph partitioning is important. Actually, our work actually showed that graph partitioning is important. There's a section that, sa that says that if you actually partition the graphs better, you get better performance, basically. Uh, but other works actually did that methodically, and they showed that you could actually get better performance. So you can see how you can co-design the algorithm and the hardware together to actually get much better performance in the systems. Uh, we asked another question in this work, basically, which, is, which was, what fraction of the benefit is coming from uh, uh, the bandwidth, the huge bandwidth that we're av making available, and what fraction of the benefit is coming from other things like the change of the programming model, et cetera. And uh, this is uh, without prefetching, basically, and this is a subset of the applications. That's why the numbers are different. But you can see that if you do this study, this is hybrid memory cube many core uh, with 640 gigabytes per second. If you magically enable eight terabytes per second bandwidth, that buys you some performance, clearly, 2.3x, which is not bad. So it's not bad. If you actually improve performance by more than 10x, you get 2.3x performance, okay, which is not bad. But this doesn't mean that all of the benefits of Tesseract are coming from bandwidth. There is a good chunk over here that's coming from the programming model and the changes that we've done. So you can see that that's about 3x over here, okay? If you do the other study, hybrid memory cube, multi-core, uh, change the multi-core to Tesseract with conventional bandwidth, you still get performance. 
it's interesting. Now you actually get performance because of the, let's say, programming model, but it's really everything else other than bandwidth. And then now we actually improve the bandwidth of this system from conventional bandwidth to test uh, like eight terabytes per second, improve the bandwidth by 10x. Again, you get about two X, right? You go from three X to, uh, to uh, 6.5x, which is a, a, an improvement about 2x. So uh, I think the takeaway here is there's a good chunk of benefit that's coming from bandwidth, but it's either equal to or less than the uh, benefit that's coming from the programming model. And if you want to get all of the benefits, you really want both at the same time, as you can see. So that's the takeaway. So it's always good to break down the benefits you're getting. And this is our attempt at breaking down the benefits, as you can see. Okay, so let me talk about energy. Clearly, energy is also important because we are not moving data off chip as much as in the baseline systems. And this is our energy evaluation. And we found out that basically average across five graph processing applications, we reduced the energy by 8x, which is a lot. And again, uh, this is not even taking into account the out of order cores over here. We want it to be, uh, yeah, uh, fair to the baseline. Uh, and essentially, later work showed that you could get even more. I, be, I believe currently uh, the number is maybe ADX or so. so I, don't quote me on it. Uh, go and look at the literature if you're interested. But basically, very significant gains are possible if you change the entire system to take advantage of the logic layer uh, uh, to, to accelerate an application, as you can see, both in terms of performance and energy. Uh, and uh, we have some analysis uh, showing that data movement reduces as a result, both performance and energy improves because we're minimizing data movement because we're changing the paradigm again. Okay, any questions? Okay, I don't see anything, but again, feel free to interrupt me also. Don't be shy. Uh, this is your, your uh, time to actually ask uh, questions and this is, this is the opportunity, I think. We can have a conversation whenever. Okay, uh, I will mon I'll keep monitoring the questions, but let me talk about the advantages and disadvantages of this approach. Uh, uh, basically, this was uh, perhaps the earliest approach in terms of specialized graph processing acceleration using processing in memory or near data processing. Uh, and it's one of the earliest approaches in using 3D stacked memories for really uh, uh, changing the entire system uh, to improve uh, performance and energy efficiency. And uh, that's a big advantage, I think. Clearly, it shows good results, uh, large system and uh, performance energy benefits. It takes advantage of 3D stacking for an important workload. Uh, and I think the importance of the workload is increasing right now. Uh, and it's, more, it's also more general than just graph processing. Even though we actually looked at graph processing, that made, us, made life easier for us, uh, clearly. But it, it was still not easy uh, to do this end-to-end -end work, clearly. Uh, but uh, you can actually use the substrate that we discussed for other things because it's a simple in-order core in the end, right? We could easily look to, have looked at machine learning. Uh, it could have been wise perhaps at that point in time also, uh, but again, we don't have enough resources. And uh, I mean, at some level, graph processing is more general than machine learning actually. Uh, I do believe this because graphs are really, really everywhere, whereas you cannot apply machine learning to everything, although people are trying to do that right now. Uh, and on top of that, I think graph processing is also inherent in a lot of machine learning problems as well. A lot of machine learning problems frameworks actually uh, uh, are, present, are, are represented as graphs underneath. But clearly these applications are all important. I don't want to go into a rat hole uh, of workloads. But uh, the takeaway is uh, this could be applied. The same substrate could be applied uh, for other applications as well. So clearly there are disadvantages here also. Uh, it changed a lot in the system. This doesn't mean it should be rejected because of that, as you already know, uh, but clearly adoption will not be easy for a system like this also, because it gives a new programming model, at least new to uh, this uh, abstraction level. And it provides specialized tester act course for graph processing, specialized because of uh, 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 both, both message passing, uh, but as well as uh, prefetching mechanisms that we discussed. Cost could be an issue, right, clearly. Uh, how do you actually build a large cube-based, uh, 3D stack-based system to accelerate these applications? And I think a big disadvantage or limitation is scalability is limited by off-chip links or graph partitioning. And that is true. And that's why a lot of future works actually targeted this. Uh, so you can actually do better uh, than what we discussed. Okay, any other things that I may have missed? Anything that comes to your mind? Okay, I don't see anything, so I'm going to keep going. I'm going to cover uh, one more thing, uh, and we're going to take a break afterwards. Uh, so basically, if you're interested in more on Tesseract, this is the paper that describes it. Again, I, as I said, it's a full system paper. Let's say, of course, it's, it's in simulation because, because of reasons that I mentioned. Uh, 
uh, and uh, it, it covers a lot of ground and uh, hopefully it gives you a different perspective on how papers can be, right? Again, it's, it's, it's similar to Ambit in the sense that it's, it covers all the way from algorithms to logic in this case. It doesn't go into the circuit level like Ambit does, but it's, it's disruptive in the same sense. And that may be one of the reasons why it was rejected uh, two or three times before it got accepted into uh, ISCA 2015, uh, as you see. Okay, so we're still talking about uh, uh, this approach, 3D stack memory, and we're, we're going to st still talk about this question. Uh, what are the performance and energy benefits of using 3D stack memory if you actually use it as a coarse-grained near data processing accelerator? And now we're not going to change the entire system, but we're going to perform simple function offloading. So uh, basically the next question can be, okay, uh, uh, changing the entire system is very interesting and let's examine it for n different applications. And I think it's very good to study it for other applications also like machine learning today. I don't know of any work that has studied it for machine learning. Uh, I think I would be very interested in that actually seeing that. Uh, because I think uh, the Tesseract system can be applied for it. Of course, I think you need to have specialized units for machine learning inside the logic layer to be able to be really competitive with uh, GPUs, for example, or other machine learning accelerators. So you, you want to have systolic arrays, for example, in the logic layer, if you want to do changing the entire system for machine learning. But let's switch gears to a simple function offloading. So let's try to be uh, more adoption focused if we don't have the freedom to change the entire system, what can we do? And uh, we're gonna talk about function offloading. Function offloading is basically, you go through an application, you identify functions that, are, that would benefit from uh, being executed in the logic layer, either in special purpose cores or general purpose cores in the logic layer or in configura reconfigurable logic, right? And I think there are many potential possibilities over here, uh, which is very interesting, but it's not as disruptive. Uh, so clearly the benefits are not going to be as high as what we've discussed with Tesseract. Uh, I mentioned this paper before. Uh, this is the work that we had done with Google over the course of one and a half years through an internship that Amirali had. And I also spent a few, several months at Google uh, to do this work right in, the sense, in that sense. And we collaborated with them to analyze multiple different workloads as you discussed. And we found out that more than 60% of the uh, energy spent uh, on data movements. And that's why we wanted to look at 3D stacked near data processing on mobile devices with those folks. And uh, let, now, now let's go into more detail. As I promised, I was going to talk about this work a little bit more and let's go into more detail. And this work is very interesting because this work is the first analysis of uh, these key mobile workloads that are used in uh, Google devices, certainly, but also uh, equivalent workloads exist in other uh, smartphones or mobile devices as well, as you can imagine. Clearly, consumer devices are very important. They're everywhere and energy consumption is an even bigger uh, concern in consumer devices than other devices. And there are four important workloads that we looked at in the study. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the web browser and TensorFlow. I'm not gonna talk about video playback and capture, even though they're really, really important, clearly. Right now, actually, all of us are exercising our video playback and capture devices uh, through Zoom. Uh, and uh, many of you have hardware accelerators inside your machines to do uh, video encoding and decoding uh, uh, in, your, in your laptops, in your smartphones, Maybe not me because uh, what I have is five or six years old, but if you have an earlier engine uh, uh, system, you probably have hardware accelerators for this and you probably have hardware accelerators for this also. Uh, I'm not sure if you have hardware accelerators for this, but some things uh, may actually be executed on GPUs for this. Uh, okay, so basically we're gonna look at those workloads and uh, we're gonna quantify the energy cost of data movement. Again, I'm not gonna belabor this, but there's a lot of analysis in the paper. But the key observation at the high level is that more than 60% of the total system energy is spent on data movement across the memory hierarchy on these workloads, which is a lot as we've discussed, and it's because we have a processor-centric design. So the potential solution we are gonna examine is moving computation close to data by doing function offloading to compute units in 3D stacked memory. Of course, the ch big challenge here is limited area and energy budget, especially if you're constrained to a mobile system that looks like this, right? This has a big area and energy budget. Uh, but I think 3D stacking is actually could be good over here, especially monolithic 3D stacking could be very good for systems like this because uh, you also have a vertical uh, budget over here. Uh, well, you also have a, a budget in terms of what you can place, how many chips you can place. If you can actually reduce the number of chips you can place in a cell phone or in, a, in any system, then you're essentially reducing the size of the system, right? Of course, you need to be careful of the thermal constraints 
Okay, so in this paper, actually, we are very careful about area and energy. So you can read the paper in terms of thermal constraints and energy analysis and area analysis. I'm not going to go into the details of any of that here. I'm just going to look at the application perspective and what kind of benefits we are going to get. Okay, so the second key observation in the paper is very interesting, I think. A significant fraction of the data movement often comes from simple functions in these workloads. Uh, and essentially, we can design lightweight logic to implement these simple functions in memory. In memory meaning in the logic layer of 3D stacked memory. We can have small low power embedded cores like what we had for Tesseract, or we can have small fixed function accelerators that are customized for these simple functions. And we're gonna look at some of those simple functions. Or as I said, I mean, this paper doesn't consider it, but you can have reconfigurable logic uh, where you can act, or you can have all of those actually. You can have a, pip, a, sim, a low power cores plus simple uh, accelerators plus reconfigurable logic. Because in the end, if you're executing many, many applications, reconfigurable logic is very nice because you may not actually cover uh, the key bottlenecks in those applications using PIM accelerators and a core may not be efficient, as efficient as reconfigurable logic, right? Okay, so the key takeaway is basically offloading the functions that we identify uh, to uh, the logic layer of 3D stacked memory improves per energy, reduces energy and per uh, improves performance by about 2x. Okay, that's the takeaway over here. It's not written 2x here, but you're reducing execution time by 55%, which means that you're improving perform well, 54%, you're improving performance by more than 2x, right? Same for energy, you're reducing energy by 55%, you're improving by 2x. So whenever you're writing or selling, write 2x. <laughs> we didn't do a good job in terms of selling the idea here, I think. It's, if you write 2x, that sounds better than 55% clearly, but it means the same thing because you're looking at the metric in a different way, right? Okay, so let's take a look at some of these workloads uh, a little bit because I think it's insightful to always analyze workloads. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time over here. Uh, let's look at uh, the exciting, well, I don't wanna say exciting, but the more popular workload first, which is TensorFlow Mobile, uh, which is, this is uh, Google's machine learning framework clearly, and we're gonna look at inference. Uh, essentially, this is a neural network. We're gonna look at many neural networks. You can see the paper, I think four or five are looked at the common neural networks like AlexNet or ImageNet. These are some neural networks that are, that are designed uh, to do uh, classification, essentially. A neural network does classification. Uh, it's also called a deep neural network right now because you have many layers. And these many layers, essentially you take as input some images, let's say, uh, and uh, you give a prediction in terms of what that image may be. You could do it for speech also, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, somebody asked, what is exactly meant with simple functions? You will see in a little bit. I'm gonna give you some examples. Uh, essentially, this neural network uh, does inference and it takes as input uh, some things, uh, uh, things to classify, and it provides a classification. I mean, cats and dogs are one example, right? You identify a cat, you identify a human in the picture, you associate it. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to go into detail. You probably know this uh, very well at this point. But this is intensive in terms of memory as well as computation because you do a lot of convolutional tasks. Uh, over here, but memory is a big bottleneck in these systems also as this paper shows, but as many other papers show also. N next week, actually, we're gonna cover some research works related to accelerating important workloads. Genomics will be one, uh, but we will also talk about neural networks and we're gonna talk about the memory bottleneck in neural networks even more next week. Uh, so uh, we, you'll, you'll see this again next time. But basically this paper analyzes how much energy spent on data movement in inference tasks in uh, commonly used networks in TensorFlow. And we found out that more than 50% of the inference, more than 57% of the inference energy is spent on data movement. And there are two simple functions. These are a, two examples of simple functions, packing and unpacking of data and quantization of data that are responsible for more than 50% of the data movements. I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail. So what is packing and pa unpacking? Basically you have some matrix, it's a sparse matrix. Uh, to be able to efficiently process the matrix, uh, what you do in the program is to reorder the elements of matrices to minimize cache misses uh, during matrix multiplication. Essentially, sparse matrix becomes a packed matrix. Sparse matrix means many values are zeros. Packed matrix means you eliminate the zeros somehow. Okay, that's one example, right, of you know, packing. Uh, so this is a reordering operation, and you can see that it consumes a lot of energy, a lot of execution time, and you can see that it, the data moment accounts of a significant fraction of the energy. And this is a simple function that does data reorganization that requires very simple arithmetic. It basically, uh, I'm not gonna go into details, but you can read the paper for more detail, uh, but that's what it is essentially. And it's very suitable as a result uh, to be offloaded to a simple engine 
in the logic layer. Either, either an engine that's specialized for doing this packing or a general purpose core that does it a little bit less efficiently, but still without, with less data movement than existing systems. Okay, what is quantization? So uh, quantization is employed in all neural networks that I know of today, actually. The, the, the realization is that uh, the data uh, types uh, that are large are not really needed. Whenever you're doing inference, you don't need to operate on 32-bit floating point operations because it's very inefficient and you don't gain accuracy. You can chop things to 8-bit integers and you gain a lot of performance and efficiency that way. Uh, and all neural networks that I know of actually do this sort of quantization today. Uh, and it turns out uh, a significant inference energy and execution time is spent on quantization and majority comes from data movement. And this is again a simple function. It's a simple data conversion function that requires shift addition and multiplication operations. Again, it's a very suitable for being offloaded to logic layer of 3D stacked memory without a lot of thermal issues. Okay, so, and then the process is basically going and identifying many of these functions, packing and quantization, you can see over here, what are the other functions, compression and decompression. I'm going to briefly talk about this later. Color bulleting, texture tiling, in video play, uh, these are Chrome browser functions. And in video playback, motion estimation is a function, for example. Basically, motion estimation is done whenever you're actually encoding different frames. And you need to estimate uh, where a particular thing moves uh, in, uh, compared to one frame from one frame to another frame. For example, if I'm moving in this video right now, I'm uh, right now uh, static, right, in many frames because I'm not moving my face. But when I move my face over here, uh, motion estimation encodes uh, those things. And uh, it encodes things as differences from the prior frames. And as a result, you get a much compact encoding whenever you're doing video decoding uh, uh, later, right? Uh, it reduces the size of video that you need to examine, basically. So that's a very uh, func uh, important function in video, and it's accelerated, for example, in hardware accelerators, in uh, for mobile phones, for example, or mobile devices, to be very efficient. Uh, basically, this er turns out that it's also very bandwidth intensive, and it's a good idea to put it inside the logic layer. And you can see, if you, if you identify these functions, and somebody needs to do this, uh, the programmer needs to do this, but of course, if you can do this automatically, it would be nice, but we didn't do it automatically. Here, the programmer, meaning my PhD student, Amirali, did this. He did a lot of the hard work and identified a lot of these functions, which was for a good purpose, clearly. You can see that the, benef uh, the energy uh, is held. And you can see that this is the PIM core energy. It reduces clearly. But if you actually design a specialized accelerator, energy reduces even more. And in some of the complicated functions, like motion estimation, the accelerator makes a big difference, as you can see over here. Uh, this is a complicated function, clearly. Deblocking filter is a complicated function. Quantization is not that complicated, so accelerator doesn't make a huge difference. Packing is not that complicated, so accelerator doesn't make a huge difference. So you can do it with a general purpose core, but accelerator always is better, clearly, right? Because it doesn't have the inefficiencies of a core, because it's designed uh, to do packing, for example, to do motion estimation. Okay, that's the takeaway, basically. You can reduce energy consumption by about 2x and more than 2x if you use accelerators. Okay, if you actually, this is the normalized runtime performance, uh, execution time. So again, the takeaway is uh, general purpose cores in the logic layer improve performance. You can see that, which is not bad, but you're actually much better uh, when you use accelerators. And that's true, especially for, again, uh, difficult functions like motion estimation. Here, motion estimation, general purpose core buys you something good, but an accelerator buys you much more, as you can see over here. And being near data is clearly good because it improves your performance by about 2x, more than 2x actually, if you use, accelerate, uh, if you use uh, general per, uh, specialized accelerators. Okay, let me go into one more workload and then we're gonna uh, take a break uh, on, on, uh, after we get to the adoption issue. So Chrome browser is also important, I think. All of us use browsing, web browsing, otherwise we cannot actually browse the web. And a lot of the browsers have some sort of structure, uh, uh, Chrome, has this sort of structure. Basically, it gets data uh, and it basically first parses it, loads and parses it, and then it does layouting, which calculates the visual elements and position of each object. And then it does painting on the screen, uh, generates the bitmaps, rasterization, paints those objects and generates the bitmaps. And then it does compositing. Well, this is fast. It assembles all layers into a final screen image. So I went through this relatively fast because my goal is really not to teach about the Chrome browser, but you really need to understand an application really well to actually offload uh, the, uh, the good parts or, or the parts that would benefit from offloading to a near data processing engine. And uh, keep that in mind always. Uh, and also keep in mind that an important 
a resource direction is how to do this automatically completely. Can you somehow completely automatically take an application and figure out which parts should be offloaded uh, to uh, a near data processing engine, given a near data processing engine? Because near data processing engine can be Ambit, near data processing engine can be a general purpose core, near data processing engine can be uh, S, uh, an FPGA type of reconfigurable logic. It could be uh, some fixed function accelerators that someone designed. It could be a combination of all of those, right? Then this problem is very interesting, actually. How do you automatically do this? And that's a big, a big uh, uh, thing that could be very, very useful for adoption of ideas. Okay, so let's take a look at the browser. Uh, because browser is important because uh, uh, we, we all have issues with it. And actually, I always open many tabs in my browser uh, than I expect. As a result, I run into issues. Uh, so to satisfy user experience, the browser must provide fast loading of web pages, smooth scrolling of web pages, and quick switching between browser tabs. In this work, we focus on page scrolling and tab switching. I'm not going to talk about page scrolling. You can actually read the paper. It's also important, clearly, whenever you scroll. Actually, whenever I scroll pages, uh, sometimes it's very slow. And usually, it's not because of the internet. Uh, well, sometimes it's because of the internet. But sometimes it's because of the responsiveness that I get from my system, because it's very memory bound. And both of these actually include page loading, uh, page, page scrolling, and tab switching. Let's, let's take a look at tab switching very quickly. Whenever you're switching between tabs, multiple things happen. Chrome, in particular, employs a multi-process architecture. So each tab is a process, separate process in the operating system. And may, uh, there are two main operations, basically. You need to context switch from one process to another's process. And then you need to load the new page that you're switching into. So there is memory consumption associated with it, basically. And uh, basically, how fast a new tab loads and becomes interactive uh, is important. Both of these become important. And memory consumption is also an issue that's important. So uh, it turns out Chrome actually uses compression, memory compression, to reduce each tab's memory footprint. So for example, if you have a lot of tabs uh, and Chrome decides that, OK, I'm running out of memory, or a tab is too inactive, it basically compresses this inact inactive tab and stores it in, in DRAM, in a compressed area called ZRAM. Okay? And then whenever you actually want to click, you click on that tab, saying that I need this tab, or predictively, maybe it predicts that you're going to need that tab for whatever reason. Uh, then uh, what Chrome does is it basically get, uh, takes uh, access as a compressed tab from memory, slowly, clearly, and then uh, decompresses it and then uh, enables the use of it. So we did a data moment study. Uh, basically, we emulate the user switching through 50 tabs. Uh, 50 tabs are not, are not uncommon, actually. I, see, I saw some of my students having more than 100 tabs, actually. Uh, I don't know how they switch between them, but hopefully uh, they're, they're productive while switching between them. Uh, uh, basically, uh, we looked at the study uh, and we, we made two key observations, basically. Compression and decompression contribute to significant total system energy, 18%, and a large num amount of data moves between CPU and uh, zero. So, and then we asked the question, can we actually use PIM to mitigate the cost? And essentially, if you have a CPU-only system, Let's assume that the Chrome, Chrome is swapping out some number of pages. Uh, to, to be able to do that, it first needs to read those end pages from memory, compress them in the CPU, and write them back into a compressed area in memory. So you basically move a lot of data in compression, as you can see, and at least high data moments. So if you actually do a CPU plus PIM and do the compression on the memory side, you swap out the end pages and then tell the PIM a near data processing engine, please compress these pages for me. The comp compressed pages do not need to move to the CPU or move uh, to an another accelerator on the CPU, potentially. But these uncompressed pages actually can stay in PIM. They get compressed using the near data processing engine, and they get written inside the PIM, inside memory. So there's no off-trip data movement, and the CPU is now relieved. It can do other tasks. Right. So both performance improves significantly and energy improves. Performance energy improves clearly because you don't do the data movements, because clearly you're not going to need these pages anytime soon. Right? Performance improves due to two reasons. One is you're, not, uh, you're doing this faster, clearly, because you're not moving the data into the CPU. And you, you may have a specialized engine. Uh, but also, now your CPU can do other tasks. Right? It improves the throughput of the CPU clearly. OK. Essentially, these are also feasible to implement in, in memory, uh, for in-memory uh, compression and decompression. I didn't show you decompression over here, but there's a similar story uh, 
for decompression. In fact, for decompression, even it's, it may be even more important uh, because it's on the critical path. Okay, so basically, as I said, both functions, compression and decompression, can get a benefit from PIM execution. And uh, I already showed you the results of the benefit. It's, you get about 2x performance improvements uh, overall in these functions. Okay, so if you're interested, you can read the paper for more detail. Uh, I'm going to cover a little bit more of these function offloading until we get the PIM enabled instructions and then we're going to stop over here. So there are many other examples of fun function offloading. You can do this in GPUs. So for example, you can have a main GPU and then main GPU can be connected to these cubes. Uh, these are called multi-chip modules, for example. And then in each of these, you can actually uh, uh, have a simple GPU to do near data processing. And then the question becomes, what do you offload to the simple GPUs? Right, that's the idea. And if you're interested, this work actually looks at that question and it also goes further. It basically wants to make that offloading transparent to the programmer. And whenever you want to make that transparent to the programmer, you need to basically automatically identify what gets offloaded from the tasks that are running over here in the GPU to the logic layer. How does the data get mapped such that uh, the tasks that are executing a logic layer actually have the data that they need in the logic layer and they don't need the data from some other logic layer. So those are the two key issues. How do you uh, offload the code and how do you map the data? Okay, there is more work in this area. You can actually take a look at this. Uh, we looked at accelerating linked data structures. Uh, this is actually a very interesting paper that looks at a latency bound application because if you're going through uh, doing pointer chasing, you're very much latency bound. And you can actually accelerate this using a, a simple accelerator uh, uh, on, on the uh, logic layer uh, that does pointer chasing. And I think this, this, sort of, this is an example of application that's very latency limited uh, due to pointer chasing, not necessarily bandwidth limited. Uh, uh, but bandwidth limitations exist because you may actually be changing many pointers at the same time uh, from different queries, right? Okay, this is also automatically accelerating dependent cache misses in the memory controller side, not necessarily in 3D stack memory, but actually in the memory controller side uh, of uh, a traditional system. You offload things into a memory controller, and this is actually doing prefetching in the memory controller. Uh, you can actually take a look at that also. And there are some new works that we have done that uh, look at accelerating climate modeling uh, with high bandwidth memory. You can take a look at that. Accelerating approximate string matching. We talked about this actually when we talk about genome analysis. Next week, we will talk about this even more because there's a lot of pot uh, interesting things that go into it. And also there's a lot of potential for future work and ideas in this direction, as I mentioned. Uh, so clearly approximate string matching is another thing that could be accelerated in a uh, logic layer of 3D stack memories. And in fact, this accelerator by itself is in the logic layer of 3D stack memories. The complete accelerator is in the logic layer. Uh, okay, and then accelerating time series analysis is also important. This, Time series analysis is actually used in many, many applications from medicine to science to astronomy, et cetera. Uh, and how do you do it efficiently becomes important because there's a lot of data associated with it. Okay, this is a great place to stop because we've covered this question right now. Uh, what kind of benefits do we get if we actually use 3D stack memory as a coarse grain accelerator by changing the entire system or by simple function offloading? And you can see that uh, uh, changing the entire system always provides much higher benefits than simple function offloading. You will see this with Genasm also actually. With Genasm, we're actually changing the entire system here as opposed to uh, offloading simple functions. We're actually really redesigning the system for approximate string matching in this case. And you will see the performance benefits that are reported by this work are going to be very, very high. I already mentioned some of them actually, uh, but they're, uh, they're going to be more than an order of magnitude compared to the best previous hardware accelerator. Okay. But that's not the case if you just do simple function offloading. Clearly, simple function offloading is more adoptable potentially, but the benefits you gain are lower, but still there are good benefits like 2x, right? 2x is not bad in my opinion. And then we're going to talk about this approach. How do we actually make things even more adoptable? And we're going to start that in the next part of this lecture. So this is a good place to stop. As I said, right now, my watch says uh, 1427. So let's take a 15 minute break again. Let, uh, it says 1428 now. Uh, let's be back at uh, 1444, 16 minutes, uh, and then we can start uh, another exciting part of processing in memory. Okay, and feel free to ask questions in the meantime or uh, afterwards. Okay, cool. Uh, so this is where we left off. As I mentioned, now we're going to look at the minimal approach to uh, taking advantage of 3D stacked memories for near data processing. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, the key question we're going to ask is, what is the minimal support we can provide with minimal change to the system and programming? And I'm going to talk especially about this work, which appeared concurrently with uh, the prior work. It is also interesting to say that this work was accepted right away. <laughs> so this, this is a work that was not rejected uh, once, <laughs> which is, so this sort of thing happens also. Uh, clearly it was, um, of course, it's a good paper. I mean, I'm not going to say bad things about it. I like it a lot, actually, as you will see. But uh, it's also, uh, I, I would say, it's also perhaps not as disruptive as the prior approaches. Uh, and it's, it's, it's coming from a more adoption perspective as opposed to disruption perspective, let's say. Uh, I think both approaches are really valid approaches to research actually. And uh, I don't know if that's the reason why it got accepted at the first shot, uh, but uh, some people, some reviewers, for example, said that, oh, I worked on processing in memory for decades. And I think this is the right approach to processing in memory. So this was a review we received uh, for this work. Now, I'm not sure if that's, uh, if I believe uh, that is the case, but I think this is one approach to uh, processing in memory, which I think should be considered. And it's uh, from an adoption perspective, uh, I think it's, uh, it's actually pretty strong. Okay, let me give you the idea. The basic idea is actually very simple. Well, I guess before the idea, let's restate the goal. Uh, basically, we want to develop mechanisms to get the most out of near data processing with minimal cost, minimal changes to the system, and no changes to the programming model. Uh, and the key idea over here is to expose each PIM operation uh, as a cache coherent virtually addressed host processor instruction. Essentially, it's an ISA instruction. We call it PEI, PIM enabled instruction. And we also add the restriction that the instruction operates only on a single cache block to avoid data mapping issues. So it's a very simple approach, right? The instruction is fetched and executed just like any other instruction, but the processor now has a choice. Should I execute the instruction in the processor or should I ship it to memory and wait for memory to execute it? That's the idea. It's very simple as you can see, right? And the programmer can program with these PIM add primitives or pragmas as you can see. And these can get translated to, into ISA instructions that look like this. It's similar to add, but it's it just as a PEI associated with it, meaning PIM associated with it, potentially executable in memory. That's the idea. So the beauty of this is clearly we're not changing the sequential execution programming model. We basically add an instruction that simply executes things uh, like any other instruction. Uh, no changes to virtual memory. Basically, there's no need to change the virtual memory here because the instruction is operating clearly, uh, uh, instruction is clearly accessing the TLBs, et cetera, when it's fetched. And also it's operating clearly uh, uh, at the ground layer, it's smaller than a page, right? Uh, there are minimal changes to cache coherence as we will discuss briefly. Uh, and there's no need for data mapping also. Basically, the instruction is operating on a single memory module. Its data is in a single memory module. Its data is not distributed across memory modules. So you don't need to deal with that when you fetch this instruction. So as, as a result, this becomes very adoptable because it avoids a lot of the issues that prior work has. For example, you cannot say the same things for Ambit. You cannot say the same things for Tesseract. And the second key idea in this work is to dynamically execute where to execute a PIM enabled instruction, basically. And this dynamic decision is done by the processor. And the processor decides whether to execute the instruction inside its execution units or uh, in uh, near a data uh, in, in the logic layer of 3D stack memory, for example, or somewhere else, right? Somewhere else could be a possibility also, but in this case, we consider two things only. And this decision can be done based on simple locality characteristics, where's the data that I'm operating on, and also simple predictors. There could be other mechanisms, of course, to uh, decide in a more sophisticated fashion, which is not examined in this work. Okay, basically the goal is to execute each operation at the location that provides the best performance. Okay, so let's take a look at this a little bit uh, by using the same example we had before. This is the page rank example. And if you look at page rank, if you want to update this next rank, you need to bring the cache block associated with it. You need to write back the cache block associated with it. So you're actually moving 128 bytes in total, assuming your cache block size 64 bytes. Now, if you change this to a PIM enabled instruction, like what I did over here, if you do in memory addition, assume that this is executed in memory. The value just needs to be shipped to main memory. That's it. So assuming the value is eight bytes, you're just moving eight bytes, right? So basically we saved, uh, we reduced the bandwidth consumption to by 16 X in this case, as you can see. So that's very powerful with a single instruction. Okay. But of course, 
this is not a good idea. And, and we, always, we always said that it's not a good idea to do something always in one place, right? There are always trade-offs associated with it. Even row cloning is not a good idea to do always in memory. But this is also not a good idea to always do in memory, right? Basically, assume that we've figured out a bunch of instructions. Uh, the question is, do we always execute those instructions in memory or in the processor? And this is uh, the result, empirical result that we have in the study. And you can see that if you always execute in memory, sometimes you gain performance whenever your graph sizes are large, actually. Not, not, uh, yeah, graph sizes are large. These are graph processing workloads because uh, your caches cannot house these. As a result, you reduce memory bandwidth consumption. That's good. But sometimes you lose performance, especially your, when graph sizes are slow, uh, small, or caching is very effective. And that's the idea over here, right? So basically, you don't want to do that. And sometimes you're in the middle. And maybe you should decide based on the uh, locality characteristics of the data that you have, right? Some, maybe you'll gain in all of them. And I will show you that we will gain in all of them, albeit some small in these cases. OK, so basically, always executing in memory is not a good idea because your caches can be very effective as well. OK, so let's take a look at these example PIM-enabled instructions. So I showed you add. Uh, clearly, add is good. But you don't want to necessarily wait for the result of the add so that the processor can continue, right? This is a very similar issue like we discussed earlier, non-blocking function calls. These instructions need to be non-blocking, meaning you send the results and then you keep executing until you get to a p-fence, pim fence. It's very similar to a barrier in this case. Basically, pim fence indicates that you should wait here and not issue more pim operations until all of the prior operations sent to memory are complete. That's the idea over here. Otherwise, you may actually get a bad result because the operations are not complete, yet you need to use a value. Right? OK. OK, this is very similar to existing programming models, as you can see. right? We have memory fences today also uh, to do the same thing. OK, uh, so these are the instructions that we came up with. That's the next question. What are the instructions that are uh, important uh, to add? And there's no perfect answer uh, to this, frankly, uh, because it really depends on the application. Uh, but we studied a bunch of applications, the 10 applications over here, uh, ranging from machine learning, uh, st cluster, uh, streaming cl stream clustering, uh, hash tables, uh, and databases, et cetera, et cetera, breadth search, graph processing, clearly, many of these. Uh, and we found out that these instructions would be useful to add. So dot product is important for machine learning, for example. Euclidean distance computation is important for series analysis, like time series analysis, for example. And you can see that. The input is, could be large here. Input could be an entire cache block. Input could be a half a cache block. And the output is actually smaller, as you can see over here. But input and output are never larger than a cache block, as you can see. Right? OK? So you can see other things like hash table probing, histogram bin indexing, floating point addition, uh, eight byte integer minimum com computation, et cetera, et cetera, over here. Uh, you can take a look at the paper. But this is an art. How do you find the instructions? It could be automated also. There are works actually that show you can automatically decide instructions. Uh, and all of those works can be used, actually. Uh, but I think overall, a good approach to incorporating these instructions is to have a flexible ISA, instructions and architecture, that can accommodate new instructions, potentially. Potentially user-defined instructions. I think instructions and architectures really need that sort of uh, flexibility. Because users or programmers may decide, OK, this is a really good instruction. Or compilers may decide, OK, this is a really good instruction for this application. If your instruction set architecture doesn't support that sort of interface, that doesn't sound good, right? As a result, you lose uh, the potential of implementing it. So your instruction set architecture needs to be nice, flexible. Uh, and also, your hardware substrate needs to be nice and flexible. If your hardware cannot uh, implement an instruction that somebody envisioned, that's not good. That's why a reconfigurable substrate in the logic layer is probably a very good idea. Uh, that way you can instantiate uh, these instructions. So I think these, uh, of course, uh, you can always take the existing approach. Like you can add these instructions into the ISA and you're done, right? But I'm thinking of a future where you can customize the system to the application that you're executing. Uh, then all of your interfaces and hardware needs to be flexible in the end. So keep this in mind. I think the future needs to be much more flexible than what we have before. And there's a lot of interesting things to look into in terms of ISA uh, as well as hardware. OK, so as I said, these are executed either in memory or processor. Uh, and we have low cost locality monitoring for a single instruction. You can read the paper. And as I also said, it's cache coherent, virtually address, and single cache block. And these instructions are atomic between different PIs. 
meaning different PIs are executed independently and atomically from each other, and but uh, not atomic with normal instructions, meaning some other instruction can be ongoing while this instruction is being executed. So we use PFANS, PIMFANS for ordering. Okay, I don't want to go into more detail over here, but the key thing that enables PIM enabled instructions is a single cache block restriction. Basically, each PIM enabled instruction can access at most one last level cache block, and that's it. This is, and there are similar restrictions that exist in atomic instructions. The reason is for data mapping. Your data needs to be mapped in the same module, basically. Otherwise, uh, you need to work to guarantee that your data is in the same module if you actually violate this restriction. That's why we said, okay, to make life easy for everyone with minimal changes, let's add this restriction such that uh, you cannot uh, use this instruction on data that resides, uh, that, that, uh, that's larger than a cache block, okay? Similar restrictions already exist, but clearly this is going to be a rest uh, it provides benefits, right? Localization, basically each PI executes on one memory module. There's easier support for a cache core in virtual memory, basically. You cannot, you don't need to keep track of multiple cache blocks. And also multiple cache blocks cannot span different pages because they don't exist. It's only a single cache block. Uh, and there's a simplified locality monitoring you can read about. Uh, by, you, can, you, can, you basically need to keep track of a single cache block to understand the locality characteristics. There are benefits, but there are also downsides to this, meaning now you cannot do operations that are larger than a cache block. Ambit is not possible, for example, right? You cannot do uh, row level operations because of this restriction, right? But this restriction makes life easier. And again, we're taking the minimal approach. We're giving up performance to, to be minimal, to be more adaptable. And you can see we evaluated this with 10 different uh, emerging data intensive work goals, graph processing, machine learning, data mining, in-memory data analytics. We use three input sets. I'm going to show you results. But the takeaway uh, is you get about 50% performance improvement with large input data sets where this is really important. And you get about 25% energy reduction. So the results are actually promising. 50% is not bad. 25% is not bad, especially energy is quite good. But of course, it's not 2x like we discussed. It's not 10x. It's not 13x. It's not 100x, right? Because we're minimal in this case but we're more adaptable, hopefully. Okay, these are the work goals. I'm not gonna go into the details a lot. You can read the paper. I think it, the paper has a very good set of work goals, for example, uh, that are uh, diverse, but you can always do better. Uh, you can always say, why didn't you examine 100 work goals, right? Or a thousand work goals or a million work goals. There's no end to it. So we did pick 10. Uh, okay, and these are the, per this is the per performance improvement numbers for large data sets. These are the large inputs. They don't fit in the cache. As a result, if you execute the uh, uh, PIM enabled instructions only, uh, always on the near data processing engine, always uh, at the logic layer, then you gain a lot of performance. But you gain slightly better performance if you actually make the decision dynamically, right? Slightly better over, overall. This GM means general, uh, uh, geometric mean. It's really the average of 10 workloads. So that's why I'm looking at over here. So basically you get significant performance benefits uh, and the execution, uh, our locality of our decision mechanism is good usually, but sometimes it's degrading performance. Sometimes it's not making the right choice actually, you can, as you can see. Okay, and uh, we're improving performance because we're reducing the amount of off-chip data transfer uh, compared to host-only execution, PIM-only execution, et cetera. Okay, let's take a look at the small data sets. These are data sets that are usually uh, fitting in the caches. And you can see that if you actually always execute in processing in memory, that's not good. I and mean, you've already seen that. There's some anomaly over here. There's not good locality over here, for example. Anyway, you can look at the workload. Uh, but if you actually have a locality of our decision mechanism, you slightly gain in some workloads, right? So overall, you gain slightly. So that's good. Meaning that this decision mechanism is making good decisions overall. Maybe not the perfect decisions, as you can see. It's not getting the best benefits always. Okay, uh, clearly, if you're always executing on PIM, if things sit, fit into your caches, you actually are increasing the amount of off-chip transfer. That's why these curves in the middle are shooting up, right? But locality aware actually is making things better. Okay, and these are the maybe the most interesting uh, data sets because these are medium data sets. It's not clear whether you should execute these in processing in memory or in the caches. Uh, if you always execute things in processing in memory, you don't lose a lot of performance, as you can see. Overall, you gain. Uh, and sometimes you gain a lot, but if you're locality aware and make the decision dynamically, you gain even more, as you can see. For example, these workloads now start gaining, right, a lot. Uh, 
with medium input data sets, meaning sometimes you miss in the caches, sometimes you hit. Uh, as a result, you need to make a decision and our, our mechanism is usually making the good decision, as you can see, because it's improving the performance, but not always, as you can see, because it's not always bridging the gap. It's not always doing better than PIM only or host only, as you can see. Okay. Well, in this case, it's doing better than host only all the time, but not uh, PIM only. Okay, so hopefully this gives you some insight into the importance of dynamic decision making also. And this is the energy consumption with small, medium, and large data sets. Uh, host only bars are on the left, PIM only bars are on the right, and dynamic decision making is on the, well, uh, PIM only is in the middle, dynamic decision making is on the right. As you can see, with large input data sets, you get significant energy reduction. With medium input data sets, you get also significant energy reduction if you do it dynamically. With small input data sets, you get a slight energy reduction, as expected. But of course, you need to make the right decision again. Locality aware is always better, as you can see. And there's a lot more analysis in the paper that you can take a look. Energy modeling is important, clearly, in simulation. And this paper does a good job in energy modeling, I think. OK, if there are no questions, I'll go to advanced and disadvantages of this approach. Clearly, this is the minimalist approach, right? Uh, I don't know if it's the minimal, minimal, optimally minimal approach, but it's a minimalist approach. And clearly, it's a simple and low-cost approach to BIM, and it has advantages. It's easier to adopt. Uh, no changes to the programming model, virtual memory. Again, that's an advantage from an adoption perspective. And it dynamically decides where to execute an instruction. Again, that's uh, advantageous because you're not uh, statically bound. And you make a better decision dynamically. Of course, this also has disadvantages. Clearly, it doesn't take advantage of a full advantage of the PIM potential. If you were executing on uh, uh, larger than cache block granularity, you would get better performance. Of course, you need to resolve uh, the other issues related to executing uh, with uh, larger granularities. Uh, and uh, other works clearly resolve them somehow or make some trade off saying that, oh, we ignore this issue because we don't have virtual memory, et cetera. Uh, clearly, uh, th that may or may not be ideal, but it's less adoptable. Uh, because all, all systems that we know of have virtual memory today, right? A clear single cache block restriction is limiting, no question about that. And there may be other disadvantages, but I'll let you figure uh, those out. If, there, if, you, if anything comes to your mind right now, uh, let me know. Okay, and this is the work, and I'd recommend you take a look at this also, because this is, uh, if you want to see a paper that got accepted without being rejected, this is an example of it. And there are many examples, actually, not uh, not just this clearly, but uh, I just wanted to mention that. Okay, so there are other issues that I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on. This one, for, uh, for example, automatic code and data, data mapping is important. Uh, automatically generating PIM enabled instructions is important, I think. Uh, there needs to be more work in that area. Uh, yeah, automatic code and data mapping is important. Automatically offloading critical code, like uh, things that do uh, traversals of cache misses, dependent cache misses, uh, like pointer changing structures is important. Uh, Excavating, basically doing things automatically is important. And these works actually are examples of automatically doing things. And that's important for adoption, I think. Uh, I'm going to talk about one issue, which is uh, automatic data coherence support, because this is a hairy issue, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and I'm going to talk about how we can potentially handle it. Uh, uh, but I'm, before that, I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about some of the adoption issues. So I'll, I'll cover this paper very briefly uh, later on. Uh, but I think I've, uh, I've covered a lot of things related to processing in memory. Keep in mind that we really design data centering architectures, and that's good for energy efficiency. That's good for high performance. That's good for latency also. Uh, in the end, minimal data movement is good for multiple metrics that we're concerned about. OK, with that, let's talk about some adoption issues. And this is uh, where things become really important, I think. And uh, adoption uh, clearly is difficult when you change the paradigm. Uh, and uh, whenever I think of adoption issues, I list them. And these are five adoption issues that I uh, believe are really critical. Some of them actually multi have multiple points in them, as, as you can see. It's not just a single point, like runtime, compilation, adaptive scheduling, data mapping, access control. All of them are bundled together over here. Uh, but basically, if you look at the adoption issues, a lot of them lie in the hardware software co-design and on the software side or helping software in some way, such that the software moves to processing in memory. This is actually interesting. Whenever you design new hardware, uh, hardware can be difficult to design, no question about that. 
But if you want to get it adopted, the difficulty really lies in the software. I'll give you several examples. The IBM cell processors, for example, when it was first uh, designed, it was a new design. First of all, it was the first heterogeneous multi-core engine. It had a control processing unit, a primary processing unit, and uh, uh, supplementary processing units, SPUs. Today, today, I'm not very good with acronyms, unfortunately. It had the PPUs and the SPUs. And uh, the uh, PPU, or the primary processing unit, actually was controlling these SPUs. I think, OK, synergistic. SPUs are synergistic processing units. Uh, they were actually doing the uh, bulk of the processing, and the other one was a control processor. Now, this was very difficult. It turned out this was very difficult to adopt because uh, the architects made the decision to not have coherence. So they didn't have coherence in this engine across the PPUs and SPUs. As a result, it was very difficult to program. It was a nightmare to program. And the compiler was very difficult to write. And uh, in the end, I think cell is right now discontinued. Even though it was a nice architecture, uh, the difficulty of programming was too much, uh, uh, the, uh, the designers decided. That's one example. Intel uh, IA64 is another example. This is the Itanium. Uh, Intel uh, was actually very bold. Uh, and they basically said, uh, we, uh, we want to uh, actually design new ISA. And uh, we want to design 64-bit ISA. Everybody wanted 64-bit uh, operands at that point. Uh, and Intel's solution to 64-bit uh, ISA was this Itanium ISA. And they, they thought switching to 64-bit would be a good time to actually change the ISA uh, a little bit. And they were very bold. They were very innovative. They changed to this Itanium ISA. Uh, well, they didn't stop x86 production, of course, because it was a big gamble for them. Uh, but uh, they, uh, they actually put, invested a lot of money and effort into designing IA64 processors, Intel Architecture 64 processors. And this really changed the ISA significantly. Basically, it was not uh, x86, clearly. But it had a lot of innovation in the ISA also. So compiler had a lot of say into how the instructions got ordered. This is an example of uh, an extended very long instruction word paradigm. Intel called it EPIC, uh, explicitly parallel instruction computing. Uh, and the compiler actually bundled instructions together and told the hardware that these instructions can be executed together or cannot be executed together. Uh, compiler did a lot of reordering of instructions. So a lot of uh, compiler research that was done to reorder instructions and get instruction level parallelism went into the compilers of Itanium or IA64. And then uh, hardware support for those compilers went into IA64. Uh, and also there was a lot of interesting hardware enhancements uh, related to that. Uh, so there was a lot of investment. And then what happened was uh, IA64 was also able to execute x86 code. But what happened was it was very difficult to adopt because there's a lot of, a huge software base. Uh, that now needed to be ported uh, to IA64, right? And some people did it, especially in the high performance computing domain. People found benefits to using uh, the compiler to actually exploit instruction level parallelism to make, their, uh, to make the applications higher performance. And these folks adopted it, but that was a very limited fraction of the space. If you actually look at uh, computing in general, high performance computing, even though it's at the cutting edge, uh, only a very small fraction of people in the world do it. Most of the world actually are uh, uh, not doing high performance computing clearly. So in the end, what happened was uh, adoption of I I64 was very difficult. So Itanium is actually, uh, I don't want to call it almost dead now, but it's close to dead. But I think Intel still continues for backward compatibility reasons uh, because it was very, very difficult to move uh, the entire industry. So even a giant like Intel uh, failed in moving the entire industry with this bold move, as you can see, because I think they didn't fully consider the adoption issues, in my opinion, uh, when, when moving to IA64. So uh, what succeeded then? So people did, wanted to move to X64. So AMD introduced x86-64, basically, which Intel failed to do. I think Intel could have done both, right? You could have done Itanium plus x86-64. But I believe for political reasons internally, uh, they didn't do x86-64. So they didn't extend the existing x86 ISA to, 60, uh, to 64 bits. And in the end, AMD did it. And everybody switched to x86-64. And A A Intel actually had to, had to actually use AMD's x86-64 also in the end. <laughs> so that's an interesting story, right, uh, for adoption, basically. So clearly, an existing ISA uh, is easier to adopt going forward 
uh, by changing it, uh, tweaking it to 64 bits, uh, making the operand 64 bits, 64 bits. Uh, but changing the ISA completely is not easy to adopt, as expected, right? So these are uh, examples from real life uh, showing that things are not easy to adopt if you actually change things significantly and things affect software a lot. Another example is data flow. Uh, data flow paradigm uh, was introduced a long time ago by Jack Dennis and Misunas uh, 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 at MIT. Arvind uh, is uh, another proponent of uh, data flow paradigm. He is also at MIT. Uh, basically, these folks published a lot of works from the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, even early 2000s, uh, saying, uh, let's switch to data flow uh, because you get a lot more parallelism clearly in programs and uh, we get a lot more performance, etc., with data flow. We discussed data flow in digital design and computer architecture, right? Data flow eliminates. Uh, the program counter so you're not bound by control flow anymore so you uh, you're only uh, restricted by true data dependencies and uh, an instruction uh, fires meaning it executes when uh, when it's uh, uh, operands are ready so you communicate the readiness of operands between instructions uh, and uh, uh, your your programming model is that way your isa instruction set architecture is data flow and all of those enable much higher performance, right? Your entire program is written in a data flow language. And as a result, parallelism happens naturally across the entire program. You're not bound by uh, sequential execution anymore, right? Because sequential execution, clearly you need to discover parallelism somehow. Whereas in data flow, parallelism happens naturally because an instruction gets fetched and executed only when its operands are ready, okay? So it's a beautiful paradigm, clearly, uh, but uh, this didn't get adopted. Uh, although in FPGAs right now, they're, they're flow, pro program with data flow a lot these days, but in a different way. Uh, uh, but this didn't get adopted uh, the way it was envisioned. And one of the reasons it didn't get adopted uh, was because I believe the adoption issues were difficult and also adoption issues were not considered a lot. So Arvind, for example, gave a keynote. It was, it was invited a, a, to give a keynote speech on data flow in 2005 in ISCA, and I was a graduate student at the time. And uh, he basically said in this keynote speech that we should have focused more on how to enable software to execute on data flow engines. We focused a lot on hardware and the interface issues, but we really never focused a lot on how to enable software to execute on data flow. That was our mistake. That's why uh, things didn't get adopted. And in 2005, it was not adopted actually. Uh, FPGAs were not as popular at that time. Right now, I think data flow has influenced FPGAs a lot. Uh, but Dataflow got adopted, adopted internally. If you uh, know uh, digital design and computer architecture, if you've taken it, you know that uh, all of the out of order execution ma machines are internally uh, mimicking what Dataflow engines do, but they're mimicking it. The ISA is not Dataflow. The programming language is not Dataflow. Uh, what is happening is internally, things are Dataflow, but for a limited uh, part of the program. But there's a cost to it, of course. Now the hardware needs to discover internally how to execute in a data flow manner. And clearly that is expensive, et cetera. Even though it's expensive, we all do it in high performance processors because it's, it buys a lot of performance, right? Out of order execution. So that's another example where adoption issues are really important. Whenever you're trying to change a paradigm, it's always good to consider all of the adoption issues. And adoption issues are usually related to what lies above you at, uh, in the stack. Yes, if you're banking on a new technology, adoption issues may be over there also. And PIM is actually interesting because it's banking on technologies plus it's banking on the software. So it's speculative in that sense. Uh, but basically you need to consider the adoption issues in the software layer. But you also need to consider how you can adopt the idea. For example, data flow idea was adapted to uh, only inside hardware, right? PIM can potentially be adapted to only inside hardware. Internally, only inside hardware, you can do processing in memory without telling anyone else, right? That's possible. Uh, but the benefits will be lower, of course, than uh, what we have uh, discussed so far. Okay, so basically I've given you examples of adoption issues in real hardware. Uh, and uh, whenever you want to change the paradigm, you will see even bigger adoption issues. And PIM is changing the paradigm much more than all of the other things that we discussed are, right? Changing the ISA is not changing the sequential execution paradigm. Changing to data flow, yes, it's a bit more disruptive, clearly, but again, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not change. It's still, you're still executing things in a processor. You're not executing things in a memory. 
PIM is even more disruptive potentially because uh, you're executing things inside the memory or near memory. So adoption issues are important and functionality of and applications and software for PIM. I believe that's one of the major adoption issues. How do we get, what kind of software will benefit? What kind of functionality should be add? And there's work going on in the group related to this that we may discuss at some point. Uh, we're looking at many, many applications, more than 400 applications or so, and looking at how to actually, what kind of benefits you would get. Can we actually automate uh, some of the functionality that needs to be in PIM and discover automatically what kind of functionality should be offloaded from software and do it automatically? Okay, that's very interesting, clearly. Ease of programming is the second one. Again, this relates to software. What kind of interface should be provided to the programmer? What kind of compiler and hardware support should be provided to the programmer to make this easy? What kind of coherent support should be provided? What kind of virtual memory support? Ideally, these should not change significantly, but if, if they change, how, sh how should they change? This is important, clearly, because a lot of programs are used to these. Uh, how do we design runtime and compilation systems for adaptive scheduling, data mapping, and access and sharing control? This is a mouthful, clearly, but me these mean that how do you map the data intelligently such that you get the benefits of PEM? We discuss this in multiple aspects. How do you schedule the code uh, such that you get uh, benefits? Do you actually execute things here or there, where? Uh, and what do you schedule? Uh, what, kind, what part of the program should go? Uh, and access and shared control, basically. How, how do you handle permissions and security in processing in memory? This is important, I think. Uh, and how do you provide quality of service to different applications that are sharing a uh, processing in memory engine? How do you actually provide quality of service to an application that's just accessing memory versus a processing in memory accelerator that's executing near memory? So there are a lot of interesting issues over here, clearly. And many of these are not fully tackled uh, in the community at this point. And then on top of all of this, how do you design infrastructures to assess the benefits and feasibility of processing in memory? And this is really important because this gives us an accurate picture. So clearly I've listed a lot of barriers here, at least five uh, plus sub bullets you can see inside each of them. But I believe uh, the most important barrier is really the mindset itself. I believe all of these barriers can be solved, but mindset cannot be solved easily. So we really need to change the mindsets or uh, uh, basically ignore some of the mindsets that are regressive I call these naysayers, as you know, from one of the earlier slides, and think across the stack, basically. Basically, we really need to revisit the entire stack to make a paradigm like this happen. And that was true for Dataflow also, actually, by the way. Well, Dataflow maybe didn't change uh, uh, some of these layers over here, but it does change a lot over here. Uh, and Dataflow found a good substrate for it recently, which is really FPGAs underneath. Uh, uh, because going from uh, going through the uh, general purpose interface didn't really work for them. But if you actually use FPGAs, an algorithm can get directly compiled into the logic, right? And as a result, you can actually use, make use of data flow much better. Whereas if you actually go through, through an algorithm and then go through a data flow ISA, yeah, you lose a lot of parallelism during that translation potentially. Uh, and that is one of the reasons why things were not very great uh, going through the stack. But FPGA has actually eliminated uh, some parts of the stack over here, enabled data flow to be successful. So sometimes technology enables the ideas also. Okay, uh, so that's another story related to data flow. But essentially, we need to revisit the entire stack to enable near data processing in a very useful and general purpose manner. Of course, uh, uh, but we, we can get there step by step, right? Of course, this doesn't mean that we revisit the entire stack. There, uh, in, uh, there may be some people who actually use near data processing uh, initially. And then over time, the user space can grow, right? That, that was true for GPUs. That was true for FPGAs, for example. They're, they always had a niche group of users, programmers that programmed using them, which, and they never became mainstream until recently, right? The GPUs and FPGAs, uh, both of them. So I think processing in memory could, be, could take a similar path as well. But it's, of course, better to anticipate these issues and solve them as early as possible so that the transition to the new technology or new paradigm is faster. Okay, so if you're interested, actually, this paper covers a lot of these issues. I'm supposed to write an extended version of this paper, actually, uh, which is due, which is overdue all already. So that's what I'm uh, going to work on this weekend. But uh, you don't have the extended version, so you're stuck with the non-extended version, but that covers a lot of ground anyway. And there's another uh, work that we looked at, uh, wrote from a more workload and programming ease driven perspective of processing in memory that also cover, covers a lot of the open problems too. Okay, some of the open problems, let's take a look. Uh, I've already covered some of them, so I'm going to uh, go through them relatively quickly. 
basically which operations should be executed in memory versus CPU? How do you map the code? How do you map the data such that uh, you have the right data in the logic layer uh, where things are executing? And there's some works that cover this. How do you schedule the code? There are some other works that cover this. Clearly, there are a lot of works that cover scheduling code, but there needs to be more works to do it automatically, completely uh, for the various PIM paradigms. Coherence is an issue. I'm going to talk about coherence a little bit to give you an idea very quickly. Maybe we'll get back to it actually when we talk about uh, coherence in multi-core systems because there's some similarity over here. I'll just give you the basic ideas right now, uh, but uh, we will defer a lot of the discussion when we really talk about coherence in systems because it's a big deal clearly. As I mentioned, IBM cell didn't succeed very well. Uh, this is the processor that is supposed to go into Sony PlayStations. Uh, it, it caused a lot of trouble and it's discontinued as a result because it didn't handle coherence well. But this is an example uh, of the performance that you would get uh, if you don't handle coherence well. So basically, we are looking at applications that are partitioned between a CPU and near data processing engine. So we're not offloading, again, we're offloading functions to near data processing engine, but CPU is also a continuing execution. And these are some applications, clearly graph processing applications. There are many of them over here. And there's in-memory databases, hybrid transactional and analytical processing workloads. Uh, it turns out uh, if you're doing analytical processing, you're actually scanning a lot of data in a database. So this is a very good for, for processing in memory. But if you're doing transactions, you actually are very much control bound. You're not scanning as much data. You're scanning very few nodes. So this is a better fit for executing the CPU. And in a hybrid transaction analytical database, you're executing both types of queries. Now this makes sense to partition the application uh, at such that transactions execute on CPU cores and analytical queries actually executes on, execute on near data processing cores. But now you have a coherence problem, right? Uh, the transactions may touch some data. Analytical processing can touch a lot of data. And if one of them modifies the data, the other one needs to know about it. Otherwise, you will get wrong results, right? Uh, so that's the coherence problem, basically. That's true for graph processing also. Basically, while the CPU threads are executing uh, on the data, PIM threads may be modifying it. I'm calling them threads right now because it's software threads that you execute on different engines. You can think of it that way. And vice versa. While the CPU threads are modifying the data, PIM threads may be needing it, reading it. And in this case, the data needs to be kept coherent, otherwise you may get wrong results because CPU may have updated the data and PIM is not aware of it, right? And you may get inconsistent results also, right? Because these updates may occur in different orderings, which we will also discuss later on. Okay, so basically, these are the, this is the performance that you get uh, if you're executing on the CPU only. You can see that it's one, which is uh, uh, the baseline. Now, if you handle coherence, and this is the ideal PIM, Ideal PIM means that you don't have any coherence overheads. So you can see that the performance on average is 50%, which is not a lot, uh, which is not small, I would say. Of course, it's not a lot, but we're only doing function offloading and maybe we didn't select the functions perfectly over here, as you can see, so you can always do better over here. So 50% on average is not bad. You can see some workloads gain 75%. Actually, these are small input sets. If you read the paper that I'm going to describe next, you can get much higher results. So. Uh, with large input sets, which are much, hard, much more difficult to simulate, which we didn't have at the time, you get uh, 8x, 10x, 30x speed ups if you execute in PEM. So I keep this number with a grain of salt. Basically, the idea is large. Uh, how are we doing with existing traditional coherence mechanisms? Fine grain coherence is MESI coherence protocol, which we will discuss in great detail later on in the course. You see that you don't get a lot of benefits because this causes a lot of data movement between the CPU and the processor. Every time you need to uh, write to a location or read from a location, you need to get permissions. That's a lot of data movement. That doesn't sound good. Coarse grain coherence means that you basically uh, get coherence permissions in a coarse grain manner, not a fine grain cache block manner. Now that leads to a lot more performance loss because essentially we do locking in this case. Whenever the PIM uh, engine is uh, operating on a function, it locks the data that it's going to touch such that CPU cannot operate on it. Now, this reduces parallelism significantly clearly. As a result, the performance loss, there's some performance loss compared to CPU only. So a PIM doesn't gain performance if you handle coherence this way. Doesn't sound good, right? In some applications, they get, it gains performance, but not a lot, right? Uh, Non-cacheable is the worst one. Basically, uh, on average at least, uh, G-mean, as you can see over here. Basically, non-cacheable means that uh, the data that PIM is going to operate on cannot be cached by the CPU. So CPU doesn't even get the benefits of caching 
for that data. As a result, you lose performance significantly, but some applications actually benefit, as you can see over here. But some applications lose a lot. So it, the, clearly, uh, none of these existing coherence approaches work well. The coherence approach that I'm going to describe next, initially it was named lazy PIM, uh, actually gets us closer to the ideal, as you can see, and it's much better than any existing coherence mechanism. And it's an optimistic coherence mechanism, as we will discuss in a little bit. Uh, okay, it was first introduced in this paper, but we changed up several things, and uh, this is the extended version. And uh, this actually has a lot of interesting things uh, beyond uh, the earlier paper. Any questions so far? Okay, well, I'm assuming that everything is clear if there are no questions. I know a lot of people are following this, and again, online. Uh, I guess it's good in these times to have the flexibility to follow online, but uh, you guys who are following it uh, here have the luxury to ask questions online. So, uh, well, ask questions right now in real time. Let me put it that way. So feel free to ask. Okay, so I'm going to talk about this paper. Again, I'm not going to go into details very briefly. I'm going to talk about, because this is the only work uh, that I know of that has actually tackled the coherence problem in near data accelerators, actually. Uh, and I think uh, there needs to be more work that needs to be done in this area. This is not an easy area. Uh, it actually spans applications, coherence, logic, et cetera, again, and then coherence, which is not an easy topic to begin with, actually, for many people. That's why you get some random reviews uh, from reviewers also sometimes, because they don't really understand what co how coherence works, uh, even in the baseline systems today. Uh, okay, but anyway, uh, so it's not an easy area, but if you actually uh, have a good idea, this could have a lot of impact. So basically, we're going to tackle the problem of uh, coherence in near data accelerators. And this is go not going to be limited to PIM actually, because uh, clearly we have many accelerators, but near data accelerators uh, are also important. But some of the ideas that we have in this paper can be applicable to other accelerators also, which um, we don't evaluate, so you can take a look at how to potentially do it. So there's a challenge, the big challenge between near data accelerators and uh, GPUs, one of the biggest challenges is coherence, as, you can, as we discussed. Why? Because there's a large cost of off-chip communication. For example, if you have the coherence directory over here, now the compute units over here needs to get permission. So you need to cross the bus. If you have the coherence directory over here, which is not the traditional case, now these units need to get permission. If you replicate it, now you need to keep the coherence directory coherent. Now there's another problem, right? If you replicate it, there's a danger over here. Uh, and uh, replication doesn't work actually very well. Uh, okay. So uh, near data uh, processing applications generate large amount of off-chip data movements uh, because of the coherence. As a result, it's impractical to use traditional coherence protocols as I showed you earlier. And this paper has some more analysis on it if you're interested. So basically, uh, existing coherence mechanisms, if you use them, they eliminate a significant portion of near data accelerators benefits. And the majority of the off -chip, the second realization is important actually, the majority of the off-chip coherence traffic generated by these mechanisms is actually unnecessary. And that's going to lead to our new mechanism. Basically, much of the off-chip traffic can be eliminated if the coherence mechanism has insight into the memory accesses. Basically, if we, can, if we can keep track of these accesses at a larger granularity and then enforces coherence. Okay, basically, this is optimistic concurrency control. If you know about transactional memory, the approach that I'm going to describe is going, are going to have similarities to transactional memory, but not exactly. So basically, we have, uh, we're going to use an optimistic approach to overcome the challenges related to near-data accelerator coherence. Uh, before checking coherence, we're going to collect information about what accesses have happened. That's what this gate insights mean, means. And we perform only the necessary coherence requests in the end. So that's the idea, coherence for near data accelerators. Uh, and we want to avoid unnecessary coherence traffic by using optimistic NDA execution. And the idea at the high level looks like this. You have CPU, CPU executes a thread. And then it offloads, uh, basically there's some marking in the CPU or pragma, uh, or automatically you figure this out, offload an NDA kernel. This is a thread that's executing in the near data accelerator. And at this point, both of them execute, meaning CPU continues execution, NDA continues execution, starts and continues execution. They both optimistically execute, assuming that there's no coherence violation, All right? So that's good, that's what optimistic means. You're optimistically assuming that there's no coherence violation, so you keep executing stuff. And you generate no coherence request at a fine grain, coarse grain, whatever manner, until the end of the NDA kernel. At some point, the NDA kernel ends, meaning this is the end of the execution in the near data accelerator. And at that point, while you're executing, you accumulate a signature. 
This is the signature of read and write locations, uh, lo addresses that you've touched. Which addresses you've read, which addresses you've written to. You do the same thing over here during the concurrent CPND execution. You keep track of which addresses you've read, which addresses you've written to. And at the end over here, you send the signature over here to the CPU and CPU checks if there is any overlap between the accesses. And of course, signatures should not be very large, right? So uh, in this work, this work actually takes a lot of care to use bloom filters. If you remember bloom filters, we use bloom filters again uh, to actually minimize the size of the signature such that uh, we don't communicate a lot between, C, uh, between uh, on the off-chip memory bus, right? That's the idea. And then if you size your signature as well, uh, and you resolve the coherence by comparing the signatures. And uh, for example, if, this, if the signatures overlap, meaning CPU read a location that NDA wrote, wrote to, then what happens is CPU tells NDA, NDA roll back to the beginning and re-execute, okay? That's one violation as you can see. There could be other forms of violation if both of them wrote to the same location, et cetera. Uh, when we talk about uh, this mechanism, when we uh, discuss coherence, uh, we will talk about that. And we may actually talk about transactional memory also. Uh, okay, and then basically, uh, as I said, uh, the, uh, the CPU, after checking whether there's overlap in the signatures, it basically says and to NDA, okay, if there's no, uh, it says to NDA, we execute if there's overlap. If there's no harmful overlap, and it says, NDA, you can commit your results, there was no coherence problem. Basically, we're doing optimistic coherence here. And the key to making this work is to make, uh, to make signatures uh, smaller size while not making the wrong decisions. Clearly, uh, a wrong decision, you don't want to make the wrong decision of committing if you're supposed to re-execute, right? That's not good. <laughs> That's a false negative, in a sense. And also, but, uh, you want to minim uh, and also, you want to minimize the decision of re-executing when you were supposed to commit, right? That's a false positive, in a sense, false positive uh, match in the signature. These, are, these don't affect your correctness clearly, but this requires re-executions that are unnecessary. It's similar to refreshes that are unnecessary, right? Again, we're using a balloon filter to minimize uh, the encoding space, uh, storage size. And as a result, we're getting false positives. We can tolerate false positives. We cannot tolerate false negatives, but we're not getting false negatives because of the way we set up the problem. Uh, but we also want to minimize the false positives because they could lead to a lot of unnecessary executions. Okay, so that's the idea. And this turns out uh, to actually uh, improve performance significantly. And these are latest results. You can read the paper, especially with larger data sets. This leads to much higher performance improvements like 6x, 10x, depending on how you partition your program. But basically it comes very close to the ideal. Ideal NDA coherence means you magically satisfy coherence, but you don't, uh, uh, you don't uh, move any data to enable it. Basically, you don't exchange any messages for coherence purposes. In simulation, you magically enforce coherence, right? There's no overhead for coherence, basically. Clearly, that's the best you can do. And we get close to that best, uh, within 10% of the performance of that best and within 4% of the energy of that best. So I think this sort of mechanism is going to be very important to develop. Uh, there's more work that needs to be done in this area, uh, clearly for adoption issues. This mechanism is a bit complex. That's the downside of this mechanism. You will see that when we analyze the work later on. So there needs to be, uh, um, uh, I think there's a space for developing even simpler mechanisms than this. And if you're interested in reading it, you can read it uh, right away. You don't need to wait for when we talk about coherence. Okay, there are other issues like how to support virtual memory, which I'm not going to go into. We don't have time for it. You can think about it. I think virtual memory is actually an even bigger uh, uh, hassle, let's say, to deal with. And you can take a look at this paper. This paper deals with it in some way uh, because it, it needs to deal with it because pointer chasing actually spans a huge space in terms of the virtual memory address space. Uh, and it basically replicates some of the virtual memory structures on near data processing engine, but it does it in a clever way. Uh, how to design data structures for processing in memory is another issue. The programming models, data structures, that needs to be tackled. And you can take a look at this paper uh, that basically looks at how to design concurrent data structures. So if your data structures inside a multi-core engine are not are concurrent, 
But if your uh, data structures in the near data processing engine are not concurrent, you can actually lose performance. Because in a multi-core engine, you can parallelize across different uh, uh, cores and you enable concurrence, of course. Uh, but near data processing engine, you don't enable concurrency, then you have a problem, basically. And this paper tackles that problem. And then, as I mentioned, simulator infrastructures are important to develop. Uh, you can look at these works that actually uh, have processing in memory simulators, uh, if you're interested. And if you actually want to do research, there's a lot of uh, folks out there that are doing research using Ramulator PIM, for example. And this is the work that has introduced Ramulator PIM. You can take a look at uh, perform, and this work also looks at performance and energy models for processing in memory, such that you can do early design space exploration and or qu a quick uh, analysis of whether your application would benefit without going into simulation. And I think uh, developing FPGA-based testbeds for processing in memory is important. And uh, we need to do that both for DRAM as well as SSDs. And you can take a look uh, at these things. OK, uh, I mean, you can also develop simulation infrastructures for PIM and SSDs. I think uh, one more thing that I will briefly describe is new applications and use cases are also really important. Because again, adoption requires everything, essentially. And again, software is really important because if you don't know how the software is going to use processing in memory, then you have a big problem, <laughs> right? That's why we've also been looking at, or many people also have been looking at applications. In fact, we started with graph processing, right? If you remember, we started with bulk, uh, applications that can take advantage of bulk bitwise uh, uh, execution. Uh, and we, uh, we also looked at uh, DNA read mapping, which I briefly discussed earlier. Uh, but basically, it's another approach uh, it, it, it basically has a, it proposed an in-memory processing algorithm for exciting read mapping by reducing the number of required alignments. It's essentially a pre-alignment filter, like what we've discussed earlier, uh, but we may talk about this more. And this leads to significant speed ups, and there's a lot more potential on top of this also, uh, as we will see with the Genasm paper. That's why we also looked at Google workloads, that's important. That's why we've been looking at different workloads that can benefit from near data processing. And again, as I said, you will see this more next week. OK, clearly, there are many open problems. And uh, uh, there are many other works that I clearly don't have a chance to cover. I covered the works that I believe are a good representative sample for you. Uh, and also, I know a lot about these works. And uh, clearly, we're doing a lot of work. Uh, we're one of the uh, few groups that does a lot of work on PIM. Uh, and there's more work to come. So you can, uh, I, uh, that's, uh, you can, you can see uh, this from a first-hand perspective, uh, first-hand being me. OK, uh, uh, now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and uh, uh, conclude. Uh, basically, uh, there's a huge challenge we have. We want energy efficiency that comes from being data centric. We want high performance that comes from being data centric. And we want low latency that also comes from being data centric. And we want computing architectures with minimal data movement. And that uh, requires intelligent controllers. We've talked about before, enabling the paradigm shift is not easy, as I said uh, earlier, but today, uh, I mean, we, I've shown the slide before. That's why I'm going through this relatively quickly. But this processing in memory or near data processing is a great example of how you can be, uh, have very large impact into the fundamentals of computation today, actually, fundamentals of computing. That's why I, I wrote the sentence over here. You can revolutionize the way computers are built if you understand both the hardware and the software and change each accordingly. And processing in memory is a great example for this, basically. You can invent new paradigms for computation, communication, storage, and processing in memory. And you could be accepted relatively easily, let's say, even though acceptance is not, is not always, uh, is, is not usually easy. Uh, today, people are very thirsty for, uh, again, uh, disruptive ideas. Because everybody's examining underlying assumptions, revolutionary science, essentially. I, uh, let's, let's call it that way uh, in Thomas Kuhn's terms. There's no clear consensus in the field as to what is the best approach. So if you say near data processing, uh, someone cannot easily refute that saying that, oh, but most of the systems are not that. Well, that's true, but most of the systems are not something else also. So basically to improve, I think people don't have a dominant theory to explain things and everybody recognizes that data movement is a huge problem. As a result, we need to do something about it. So basically PIM is a great example of this paradigm shifts that are really talked about uh, by Thomas Kuhn and introduced actually by Thomas Kuhn uh, in his seminal work over here. And I would recommend reading it actually, because he talks about many other paradigm shifts in science uh, 
and again, science and engineering, they're the same to me. Uh, 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 he talks, uh, he gives a lot of examples from physics and astronomy and chemistry, for example. Uh, uh, but you can see examples from computer architecture and computing, uh, and maybe living examples from computer architecture and computing. So you may be actually living their evolution over here as it happens. And uh, their uh, the adoption is not going to be as bad, I think, because there are people who are actually building these engines right now. UPMEM is an, an example that we discussed. Basically, these folks have near data processing engines inside the DRAM chip. Uh, these are simple processors attached to a bank that can operate on the bank, essentially. And you have many of them. So for example, if you have eight banks in a chip, if you have eight chips, uh, well, if you have eight banks in a chip, essentially you're uh, operating on, uh, you have eight processing units, right? But uh, with many more modules and many more chips, you can have many more uh, processing units. And I think you can see that 16 over here. Uh, uh, but I think uh, you can scale it up more. Okay, uh, so let me conclude, I think. Uh, we discussed uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs multiple times and we motivated processing and memory from an energy efficiency perspective, but it's also important from a speed perspective. In all uh, aspects of life, we actually want more speed to, to make things faster, right? As long as you can put it to good use, of course, right? The speed, and I believe you can put things to good use everywhere. And as a result, I think PIM is also motivated from high performance. Uh, and uh, it enables high performance, energy efficient, and low latency architectures. Because if you're closer to data, you're fundamentally lower latency. Uh, so we have an opportunity for minimal data movements. Uh, uh, I will repeat some of the slides that I introduced earlier. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail since you saw these slides, but I think it fits PIM really well. Because if you think about processing in memory, it's really an architecture that's based upon principle. It's not based on precedent, right? Precedent is all processor-centric architectures. But Principle today means that we should be data centric. We should minimize data movements because that's our huge bottleneck. So let's be principled. Right? And you know all of these. I'm not gonna uh, go through this in detail. This is an architecture that's not bad, that works. In fact, that's probably good uh, by some standards. I don't mind living in the woods potentially, uh, but uh, it's a precedent-based architecture. It's like the processor-centric architecture, right? It works okay. But it's not as comfortable as this, perhaps, and it's probably not as good as this in terms of uh, how organically fitting it is to the environment. And you can read more about it uh, to understand what I mean. Clearly, there's a principle uh, behind it. Again, train stations, as you saw before, this is works. It works. It's processor-centric. It's not bad, uh, but maybe not as great as this in terms of principles, right? Uh, okay. Of course, these principles come at a cost also, uh, but uh, changing to a new paradigm always comes at a cost, right? I, would, I see this as more, let's, uh, of course, analogy breaks at some point, but this is the principled architecture, it's data-centric, whereas uh, precedents are uh, clearly not data-centric, they're processor-centric. But in order to move from processor-centric to data-centric, you need to put some effort. It's not coming free, coming for free. Uh, you need to put a lot of money, you need to put a lot of effort in terms of uh, many different things that you need to do. That's true for processing in memory also, basically. Uh, and in the end, once a new paradigm comes into place, everybody forgets the effort. Well, maybe not everybody, but people forget the effort over time. Basically, this is the new paradigm, right? Before it existed, everybody complained. Well, that was true for Shalov and also probably because it cost some money clearly. Uh, but before this existed, it was expensive. Before this existed, it was expensive. Before this existed, it was expensive. Why does anyone want this? Uh, and after, now that it exists, it's caused a paradigm shift. Uh, people appreciate it, at least most people, right? Uh, and they go and live next to it. And I, whenever I go there, clearly this is in New York City, uh, uh, in the close to the World Trade Center, for example. Uh, but basically, whenever I go there, they're all, I always find, uh, tens if not hundreds of people just standing there and looking and uh, looking at how beautiful this is basically. Anyway, basically a paradigm shift gets you to a better place, but it comes at a cost. Okay, uh, I think it's always good to think about overarching principles for computing also. Again, as I, I don't know uh, exactly what are the overarching principles, I'm gonna list some principles, but I don't think there's a single principle. And I know that that principle is really not uh, processor-centric design. 
that could be one of the principles in a limited domain, but I believe uh, real world is much more data centric uh, and much more distributed. Intelligence is all over the place. And brain is one example of this clearly. I don't claim to know everything about the brain, but data centric architectures, distributed architectures are much more resembling how brain does computation. If you know anything about brain, does how the brain does computation. Uh, so clearly, I think we're, uh, uh, the nature, uh, there are some natural principles uh, that uh, can be adapted to computing also. I'm not suggesting that all principles need to be natural uh, to, uh, that are used in computing, but systolic arrays is another example, if you remember, right? Systolic arrays uh, are motivated by a principle of the nature, uh, which is how heart pumps blood to the veins and the cells, and how that blood gets communicated, and how... The, uh, basically, H.T. Kung, when he developed the idea, uh, he basically said uh, heart is uh, to uh, memory and cells are processors. And we want to minimize the memory usage, memory bandwidth usage, uh, and enable a systolic operating uh, system such that uh, the blood data uh, flows through the veins such that it gets operated on different cells, different processing elements. So that's the analogy. That's another principle if you will, that's motivated by nature. And I think processing in memory, processing near to where the data resides is another principle uh, that is employed here. Okay, so uh, I think it's time to des design principled system architectures to solve the memory problem. I'm gonna conclude the uh, processing in memory lecture soon. Uh, we want to design complete systems to be balanced, high performance, energy efficient. And I think this requires being data centric or memory centric. And this requires enabling computation capability inside and close to memory. Uh, but also the general idea is processing data where it makes sense, really, where the data is. Uh, if the data is in a sensor somewhere, let's do the processing inside the sensor, right? Let's not move the data all the way from the sensor somewhere. If the data is in a sequencing engine, let's do the processing in a sequencing, genome sequencing engine, for example, so that we don't move the data, okay? Uh, so the general principle is really bigger than memory. It's really about data and how we move the data, how we don't move the data actually. And I, as, as I showed you in this lecture and the previous lecture, this can actually lead to orders of magnitude improvements in terms of both performance and energy. And there could be other benefits in terms of other metrics, clearly. This can enable new applications and computing platforms like new genome sequencing engines and who knows what else, right? Uh, it can also enable a better understanding of nature actually. This is really interesting. Uh, I think, uh, for example, psychologists for in the last decade, uh, used computer as a paradigm for understanding humans. And uh, clearly computer is processor centric or understanding the brain, let's say. Uh, and clearly uh, computing is, uh, computers are very processor centric and they quickly figured out that this is not going to work because uh, uh, nature is really not, uh, is, is really at odds with the processor centric design paradigm. As a result, we cannot understand the brain very well. Uh, by using computers, or ex at least existing computers as a paradigm. Uh, so there's a lot of work in neuromorphic computation, actually, uh, that uh, tries to bridge that gap, basically. You, uh, neuromorphic computation is really imitating uh, how you do uh, computation inside the brain. Uh, of course, with our limited understanding of how the brain works right now, but you actually do operations in terms of synaptic pulses, et cetera, and you do the communication across these synapses, uh, uh, or neurons, uh, let's say uh, you do synaptic communication across the neurons, and that is better than a processor-centric computer in terms of enabling a better understanding of nature. So if you, for example, look at neuroinformatics conferences, there's a neuroinformatics, neuroinformatics institute actually in uh, ETH, it's, it's together with the University of Zurich. They actually work together with neuroscientists to understand whether these neuromorphic computers can enable a better understanding of neuroscience as well. So basically, I think uh, processing in memory is very similar from that perspective. Uh, systolic arrays are very similar from that perspective. Can we understand better uh, by building these systems? Uh, can we understand the nature better by building these systems and working together with other observations we make in neuroscience, et cetera? So, and who knows what else, right? I believe uh, processing in memory can enable many other things that can potentially uh, be something else, right? Okay, uh, so let me take the question uh, toward the end. There's a question over here, but I think uh, let me finish this and then I will take it uh, toward the end. Uh, 
so I think despite all the challenges, the future of processing in memory is very bright. Uh, clearly there are challenges in technology, there are challenges all across the stack, adoption issues. Uh, it can enable orders of magnitude of improvements and new application and computing systems. Yet, I believe we have to think across the stack and design enabling systems. We cannot, uh, we cannot say, oh, I'm going to work on logic and devices, and that's going to enable processing in memory. Good luck with that, uh, because you need to really consider upper levels of the stack. If you don't consider, you may actually come up with a device that's great, but it's useless. Uh, similar up here, basically, you need to really consider the hardware to take advantage of processing in memory, and you need to consider all of the layers in between to enable adoption, right? is we, we need to design enabling systems, which means we need to enable adoption. But we can get there step by step. Uh, if if some, somebody says, no, this is not possible, uh, you can always give the examples of being step by step and also give, you, uh, give the other examples that we've discussed. If somebody says, I don't care about adoption, now you have a lot of examples to actually use from this lecture. But if also somebody says, oh, uh, uh, this is, uh, mm, Essentially, it's not going to solve the problem, then you can, you can say step by step. You can use the bridge example as well uh, in, in the right context. So these are some good principles, in my opinion, that could be very useful in uh, system design, data-centric systems, uh, making all components as intelligent as they need to be. I think uh, many components today are completely dumb. Storage units, for example, memory units, interconnects, they cannot do computation. They don't even know what's going on with the data, right? They're just dumb. You just ask them, give me the data and they give you the data. <laughs> That's it. So I think we can do much better than that. We can have better cross-layer communication, better interfaces to communicate more from the higher levels to the lower layers such that we can take advantage of hardware, software, co-designs much better. For example, we can communicate properties of different data elements. We can pro communicate properties of different data structures. There are many things we can do over here that we're going to talk about in later lectures that can enable uh, better systems, not just processing in memory systems, but better systems in general. Uh, better than worst case design, we're going to talk a lot about it later. Uh, this is actually a principle that's employed in processors. For example, if you're not using the processor, you can scale the voltage down. You can scale the frequency down. Uh, you don't need to have worst case latencies in memory, for example. We're going to talk about that. Uh, but basically, we should not design systems assuming the worst case. We should really have adaptive systems that can adapt to the workload, adapt to the environmental conditions, adapt to what we really need at that point on time as opposed to not being adaptive and uh, always uh, uh, operating under the assumptions of the worst case. For example, in DRAM, the worst case assumption is refresh, right? You, we need to refresh everything every 64 milliseconds or 32 milliseconds. But a better than worst case design questions that assumption and does the refresh in a way we discussed uh, in, in the memory refresh, memory data retention lectures. Heterogeneity is a very fundamental principle. And I think all of these are principles of nature, actually. Uh, which is really interesting. Uh, heterogeneity is heavily employed in the nature. Everything is heterogeneous. We're going to talk about heterogeneous systems also. And I think heterogeneity is important in computing system design as well. And flexibility and adaptability, I discussed that in multiple uh, ways. For example, I think we need to be more adaptive and flexible to handle security issues, right? Memory controller needs to be more reconfigurable, adaptable, patchable, etc. Better than worst case design requires flexibility and adaptability and I think you can give many, many more examples over here from uh, both performance, reliability, security, and energy uh, metrics. But I think, I mean, these principles are good to discover. There may be more principles. If you come up with no, more principles, please let me know. It's good to expand this list. I think this is uh, quite comprehensive, but there may be more. But I think more than anything else, we need open minds. And that's probably the best principle that we can ever have uh, because, uh, if you don't have this, you can come up with all kinds of principles and it can fall on deaf ears, right? That's why education is extremely important, I think. Uh, we, especially today, we need more open minds than before because it seems like sometimes in the past, people were even more open-minded than before. They would be more scientifically oriented. Today, you see all kinds of really weird stuff that's questioning even scientific methods and uh, coming up from very, very high up people in politics in many, many countries, not just one, uh, but in one of the leading countries also. Uh, really, really weird statements, unreasonable statements about science not being the right thing and uh, dogmas being the correct thing, right? So that's why I think this open minds is really, really important, especially today, because I think there is uh, there is a possibility that science may be lost uh, if uh, if the wrong forces in the end win, right? Uh, anyway, 
uh, I think that that's why this is really important. Uh, and uh, this was important uh, for me even before these forces were in place. But I think these, for these forces are now in place to destroy science. Uh, we're in a very bad, we could be in a much worse situation 10 years or 20 years down the road. Uh, because as you can see, some of these forces are denying that even climate is not a problem, right? Even though there's a lot of scientific evidence and scientific studies that show that there is a problem here. Okay. Uh, uh, let me uh, end up with a positive note also. So there clearly could be naysayers, uh, but uh, naysayers are not always successful, right? So uh, there are other doubtful technologies. Uh, for, for example, there has been a very doubtful emerging technology that has been extremely successful and that has revolutionized our lives for good or bad. <laughs> Again, any te technology is agnostic, but this technology is used in pretty much all our systems today. It's not DRAM. I'm talking about a memory technology, but it's not DRAM. Clearly, DRAM was disruptive, but it wasn't as doubtful uh, uh, as this technology. Can anybody guess what that is? You have access to slides, so you can probably guess the next slide. But basically, this is, I'm talking about flash memory and SSDs. This is actually a very doubtful emerging technology. This was very doubtful for at least two decades. People were working on flash memory, and other people said this will never work, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I know people were actually very uh, forward-minded, uh, open-minded, and they actually wrote proposals to uh, the science bodies in multiple countries, National Science Foundation in the US being one of them. They were basically working on something called garbage collection for SSDs. Uh, and this person got rejected uh, for uh, multiple times for the reason being, uh, for the reason that, uh, well, with the reason given that okay, this technology will never be successful. Why are you working on it? Go work on something else. This is similar to the review that we received earlier that I mentioned, right? Why are you working on multiple bitwise operations? Go work on zeroing pages, even though we already worked on it. <laughs> uh, that aside, right? So uh, flash memory actually had uh, a rough time, let's say, uh, for decades. And clearly you can see it goes back to 1967. I snapped this picture in the last flash memory summit that I attended. And there's a lot of work clearly in 2000s or so. And the work goes on. Clearly, it's in all our devices. I think cell phones were enabled because of flash memory, actually. Otherwise, where are we going to store all of our pictures that we're going to waste, right? That's a joke, of course. But clearly, flash memory has been very disruptive in the systems. Now, flash memory is easier to adopt in the sense that it doesn't affect the software stack as much as processing in memory. So that's the upside of flash memory. But it was harder to adopt in the sense that you needed a lot of manufacturing technology to go behind, behind it. So the lower levels, technology levels were harder with flash memory, whereas upper level software levels were easier. In processing in memory, I think the lower levels, technology levels are easier because existing technologies are actually potentially good enough to begin with, but the higher levels are harder. How do you adapt the software stack? So clearly not all disruptive idea has the same type of a disruption or impact on different layers of the stack. Okay, uh, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to again recommend these two papers uh, for you to read. I don't think any of them are required, but you will benefit a lot. Since we don't have readings required, uh, we don't have a book required, I think this is the best you can get close to a book. This is actually a book chapter or invited paper actually. Uh, okay, so let me handle this question and handle any other questions and then we will conclude. So let's see. Uh, I'm wondering a more general question remark. I'm wondering if you have already thought about a probably even more disruptive way of tackling the expensive data moment. I like this already. The improvements shown during this lecture are still kind of thinking about memory as dumb slave device similar to GPUs. How about using a more balanced idea of memory coprocessor connected over a cache coherent protocol like OpenCAPI and sending it, for example, data centric programs, high performance, for example, stencil chains, graphs that the memory control executes besides serving naive memory requests. So uh, first of all, I think I will correct something. I think, uh, I don't think that we're thinking of memory as a dump slave device uh, still. We're basically adding intelligence to the logic layer, closest to memory. Yes, we're not adding intelligence to the cells. Uh, that's what Ambit does, right? Uh, so I don't think it's as bad as what we have discussed. I think what you have is actually similar. Memory coprocessor connected over a cache coherent protocol. Uh, uh, I mean, Tesseract does it without cache coherence, uh, but uh, I think uh, a lot of near data processing engines uh, are uh, uh, similar to what you have described. Actually, the 
uh, the near uh, uh, the paper that I mentioned over here. I'm going to get back to it uh, earlier, where we actually accelerate the. Uh, okay, why this is so small, uh, so slow? Where we okay screen sharing stopped for whatever reason. Uh, I don't know why it stopped. I'm going to get back to it. Uh, But this work that I mentioned, Nero work, uh, does essentially exactly what you suggested. It's, uh, it's actually over open CAPI. Uh, uh, it's, it basically uh, offloads stencil computations to a high bandwidth memory engine on the other side of the open CAPI framework uh, on an FPGA, to an FPGA basically. So I think uh, I don't I don't think these are actually uh, more or less disruptive than each other. In fact, I think this is less disruptive. This sort of solution is less disruptive compared to Ambit, for example. Ambit really change or or compared to some uh, non-volatile memory technologies that can do matrix multiplication inside the memory cells. It's still disruptive, uh, but uh, clearly at this point you can do it uh, because this is actually results from real systems, and we have some more work going on in this area. So if you're interested, you can talk to us. Uh, there's actually more to do in this area, so if you're excited about it. But I encourage your, your idea, uh, even though I disagree that, uh, that some of these things that you think as disruptive may not, may, uh, may not be as disruptive uh, as you think they are, uh, still they're important to explore and they are clearly disruptive than uh, doing some of the other things that we didn't discuss, like processor in, mem processing, in mem uh, like processing in the processor or having accelerators on the processor side, et cetera. Right? So it's great that you actually brought this up. Uh, because this is something that we can actually do today. And the trends in industry are actually supporting this. So, uh, so th there's actually something good here that you mentioned because trends in industry are actually towards uh, doing computation off uh, the CPU chip because now you have a cache coherent interface to, so, to an FPGA, for example. And you can actually uh, replace that FPGA with a processing in memory engine as well. Okay, that's great. Okay, any other questions or comments? I think we're already out of time. So, so this is probably a good place to stop. Uh, so I'm going to see you next week. Uh, have a good weekend. Uh, and good luck with all the assignments that we have. Okay, there's another question. Maybe I'll handle this very quickly. Uh, yeah, I think that's certainly possible. Basically, the question says uh, loading a data-centric program and run it on a reprogrammable part on the memory controller. Yes, I think, I think that would be great, actually. Uh, and I think for that, you need to actually, uh, it's, it's very consistent with what we have done over here with Nero. And essentially here, you can think of uh, the FPGA as a reprogrammable part of the memory controller, even though it's not exactly the same thing. So maybe, maybe we can discuss what you have in mind in more detail, but I think that's, 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 a, that's certainly a good direction. Okay, I'm going to stop here. Uh, have a good weekend uh, and uh, take care.